everybody. Welcome back to Emotions and Potions. A love slash hate letter. I'm Ashton. And, I- and welcome to this week's episode. We're so excited to be back and ruin another romance novel for you. A very, very dark romance novel. Holy shit. So dark. Like, I'm still processing. I think I'll be processing for a long time. Yeah, especially because we're currently reading the follow-up book to it as well, so we have not gotten out of this world. No. And if you're wondering what the fuck we're talking about, we are talking about Haunting Adeline by H.G. Carlton. This book was low-key banned. I think it was taken down. It, yeah, it was taken down from... Not banned, but taken down. And I can understand why. Holy moly, we are about to really dive into this one triggering 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 if you do not like dark material if this is just not your thing please stop because you're only gonna get upset it's gonna get bad it's gonna get bad before it gets better and it gets really bad this is definitely listener discretion advice so let's talk about these content and trigger warnings yeah alex tell me what i'm going to be seeing in this book so in haunting adeline first off it's a cliffhanger ending This is a dark romance containing graphic violence, murder, dubious and non-consent, stalking, explicit sex, kinks including degradation, gunplay, bondage, somnophilia, subject matters such as child trafficking, human trafficking, pedophilia, child death, and human sacrifice. Yeah, you're going to get all of that in spades, so like I said... If this is not your type of content, do not go any further. You have been warned. (laughs) You have been, we have warned you multiple times. Sorry, not sorry. If you continue, like, continue at your own risk. (laughs) I think this should have, like, a sign that, like, that's what this episode is. Caution, do not enter. Police tape, do not cross. (laughs) Danger zone. Red flags. (laughs) Warning, 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 warning. Yeah. So, let's start out a little bit on a lighter note with this book. Haunting Adeline is a dual POV from the points of view of the manipulator and the shadow. And also, each chapter ends with a letter. So Ashton hit us with this plot synopsis. Okay, so this is what's on the back of the book. The manipulator. I can manipulate the emotions of anyone who lets me. I will make you hurt, make you cry, make you laugh and sigh. But my words don't affect him, especially not when I plead for him to leave. He's always there, watching and waiting. And I can never look away, not when I want him to come closer. The shadow. I didn't mean to fall in love. But now that I have, I can't stay away. I'm memorized by her smile, by her eyes, and the way she moves, the way she undresses. I'll keep watching and waiting until I can make her mine. And once she is, I'll never let her go. Not even when she begs me to. This book was previously banned on Amazon due to the trigger warnings. Please read reviews or go to the author's website. So as far as synopsis go, it kind of gives you an idea of the relationship aspect, but no plot. If you were to read this, you would not realize how dark it was. As far as a synopsis goes, though, you are getting nothing on the insight of what this book actually entails. Yeah. So it does a pretty good job at being mysterious. And it's a discreet cover as well. Yeah, I would it never is- expect this to be so intense. Yeah. The, the artwork is a little darker. Dark, right. You know, it's grayscale with some skulls and, like, a little bit of red and stuff. But, but it's it almost still... looks cartoony. Like, it doesn't look, like, real bad. Yeah. You know, it has those themey type of things. It's, but it's more of, like, an aesthetic to what the triggers are without giving... Anything away. Yeah. So, Alex, before we start breaking down this book, <laughs> we've, got, we've done the synopsis. It's time for the potions aspect. Can you please tell... What we are drinking today, it looks beautiful. Thank you. So this is Shadowed Rose. One of the POVs is the shadow. And he likes to leave our heroine, who's the manipulator, roses. And it is like a martini, yes. right? It's a, it's a martini, so it's gin. So this is gin, some homemade lemoncello, blueberry simple syrup, because also our heroine was drinking blueberry martinis out the gate in this book. Yep. You shake it till you can't shake no more. <laughs> then shake it till you can't shake no more. Strain it. Topped it off with some Sprite. Why not? Why not? 
you like your drinks on the lighter side. I need a lighter side drink today. And then I did throw in some frozen blueberries and a couple of raspberries. All right, let's try this bad boy. The Shadowed Rose Martini. Yum. Delicious. That is delightful. Yeah, it's very like, it's light. The color is like a, it's almost like a blackberry color lighter. Yeah. A little bit lighter than like a blackberry. Like if you were to kind lighten of more it up of a, a little. Like a, more of a purpley red. So Alex, you succeeded another week that I enjoy the drink that you have prepared. And the video of how we made it along with the recipe will be on our Instagram. Which on our is TikTok now. On our TikTok, which are both Emotions and Potions Pod. That is for both Instagram and TikTok, where we will have the video and instructions on how to make it. And the recipe will also be in the podcast description. So make sure you follow and subscribe and let us know if you like our pod because we like our pod. And let us know if you like <laughs> Shadowed Rose. Yes. And let us know if you liked this book, if you read it. Like, what are your thoughts? Because we have so many. Yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of emotions swirling around. So without further ado, I think we just need to kind of nosedive into this yeah, bad boy. We need to dive into this. This is therapy. So <laughs> right. let's begin session. <laughs> let's start. <laughs> Haunting Adeline. Adeline, also known as Addie, is an author. She's doing a book signing, and she notices a strange yet attractive man watching her very intensely. Before she can say or do anything about it, he disappears. Gone. See ya. Ghost. (laughs) Addie's best friend, Dea, sets her up to have a casual sex evening with her ex-boyfriend, Grayson, which does not turn out well. No. I mean, <laughs> one night stands with the ex typically don't. Never backslide. Addie is is not into this less than mediocre sexual evening that's happening. Thankfully, question mark, <laughs> that does get interrupted by a loud bang on Addie's front door. Yeah, Grayson, not a good lover. Not no. anyone that you don't want to hook up with, I don't think. Like, his game is just not good. Off the bat, it's just he's, bad. And he and he's very much, like, complimenting himself. Like, oh, baby, you know you missed me uh, and want me. Like It's about time you've, like, realized it. Like, yeah. get off your high horse. Uh, like, Grayson, simmer down. <laughs> yeah, he sucks. Yeah. So Addie is freaked out by this loud banging on the door. And Grayson continues to suck because he doesn't, like, take charge of the situation and figure out what's going on. He, like, gets mad at her, like... Oh, do you have someone else coming over? Like, what the fuck? And then makes her go. <laughs> yeah, makes her go Check and it deal out. with it. And she she does she does go and investigate and like sees that nobody's there. So she shuts the door and like Grayson's trying to like restart this hookup session. Yeah, the hookup session and like he's still naked and obviously like Addie's sexual desire is like gone now. She wasn't really even in it to begin with. Yeah. It went from like <laughs> 50 to, fat. to negative 50 yeah. <laughs> and Grayson gets so butthurt about this that he winds up punching a hole in the foyer of her and he winds up like going to collect his clothes that he like ha- was just kind of discarding, discarding on the way through yeah. the house and he winds up walking out the door with just one sock on like I'm sorry who who leaves butt ass naked with one sock you Grayson, couldn't eat, you couldn't put the other sock on at least. Like, no, <laughs> terrible. When Addie comes back and she does start to inspect the damage done by Grayson, and she finds that it's like a false wall, and it because was, this house is also like, yes, it's old. So this was her originally her great grandparents. They built it. It's a Gothic Victorian style home. Very creepy. There's been a lot of Descript- deaths. Yep, descriptors. Uh, there was like. Five of the original construction workers died, and apparently there's been, like, more deaths around the home, so... And it's, like, black. It's yeah. a black Victorian house, like, on the cliff, and this takes place in Seattle, so it's, like, you know, that Pacific Northwest so landscape. it's always, like, foggy and rainy. Just very creepy vibes. Like, the house you would not want to go trick-or-treating. And, like, the inside is very gothic, too. Like, it's very black, white, and red interior design decor, and the house is kind of run down, so there's, like, overgrown weeds and, like, ivy growing up the top of it. And, like, there's always a presence in the house. Like, the house feels haunted. Right. 
And, like, it, Addie, like, swears that it is haunted. Mm-hmm. So when Addie starts to inspect the hole that Grayson punched in the wall, she winds up finding um, an old picture of her great-grandmother and a safe. After she breaks into the safe, she finds journals from her great-grandmother, which reveal that she had a stalker and she fell in love with her stalker. And when Addie returns to her bedroom, she finds a single red rose has been left for her on her nightstand, and it was not put there by herself or Grayson. Mystery's already beginning. We're already kind of like, what What, is going on? Yeah, what's happening here? The setup is already like, what? Yeah, a lot of things already happening. So Addie winds up calling Dea and informs her of the break-in and the rose. Dea decides to come over the next day to help Addie go through, like, remaining items left in the house um, that were left there by Addie's now-deceased grandmother, who left Addie the house. And she tries to convince her friend to leave the creepy old house. So Adeline is adamant she's not leaving Parsons Manor, which is the name. Because, of course, the creepy haunted Victorian home has a name. Has a name. (laughs) Because why wouldn't it? (laughs) And she doesn't want to leave this house because it meant a lot to her grandmother and they had a very close relationship. She also loves the house. So she just, she doesn't want to go. And she doesn't want to let someone else or something force her out. Yeah. And also Adeline has plans in place for the house to receive much needed renos. Red roses keep appearing for Adeline and she's starting to become aware that she now has a stalker of her own, which has her very much on edge. Especially as she keeps reading these journal entries from her great-grandma. It's like deja vu. Yeah. And (laughs) learning about her stalker, it's just... It's a lot (laughs) for anyone. Yeah. To deal with, for sure. Yeah. So there's one day when the house is being worked on that a dozen roses wind up getting left for Adeline. And a card is left with them. So this is the first, like, kind of conversation Between her and her stalker. Yeah. And the card says... I'll be seeing you soon, little mouse. Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) So more creep factor. Yeah. Adeline's mother then decides to drop by unannounced for a visit, and they have a very strange relationship, to say the least. Yeah, definitely. I wouldn't call it a good relationship. No, not at all. And, like, they're very polar opposites. So opposite. Like, beliefs every, like... They're just very different people. And Addie's mother is constantly trying to persuade her to sell Parsons Manor. And on this visit, she decides to tell Addie about the fact that there have been multiple multiple murders in the home, including that of her great-grandmother, which has never been solved. So her great-grandmother's death is a cold case, and she's reading these journals, entries, and kind of starting to learn about the events leading up to her death. And didn't she not know that her great grandma was murdered? Wasn't yeah. it just like she died young? Mm-hmm. It was never like disclosed to her that she was murdered. Right. So this is also like just this is a lot coming on her plate all at one time. Oh, and then to top it off, she was murdered in her bedroom, which became Addie's grandmother's room and is currently Addie's room. So she's staying in the room in which her great grandmother was killed in. Yeah. And then Adeline starts to believe that her great-grandmother's stalker is the one that killed her. So she starts to become even more weary of her own stalker situation. We do start to learn more about Adeline Stalker, who has identified himself as Z. That's all we know. (laughs) Just Z. And he is a hacker extraordinaire who has created his own organization called Z. And his mission, as well as the organization's mission, is to expose corrupt government and official government officials and find and eliminate human trafficking rings and pedophile rings while getting the victims out safely and starting them up with like new identities, fresh start. So Z is an anti-hero. Yes. That's like the best way to kind of describe him. Mm -hmm. He's doing good things in bad ways. Yeah. So like very much like Punisher, Dexter. He's definitely like the judge, the jury, the executioner. executioner. Like, his mindset is just very, like, I'm taking out evil. Yeah. If you're evil, you're on my list. You know what I mean? That kind of mindset. But ultimately, he is not a bad guy, per se, because of who he's stopping. Yeah. He's a killer with a code. Yeah. Yeah. Still not great, but... No. Could be a lot worse. And then I feel like this 
how he goes about finding these human traffickers and pedophiles and just bad people, he does that by, he has to stalk their lives. And I feel like that kind of is bleeding into his personal life. And his romantic life, you don't say. <laughs> yeah. A lot. <laughs> yeah, because he's full out stalking. Like, there's no doubt. And, like, he even admits it in his own point of view. Right. Like, he's aware that he's stalking her. Yeah, he knows. He just does what he wants, and that's what he wants to do. Yeah. So. so, Z and his right-hand man, Jay, are currently in the process of finding uh, members of a child sex and human trafficking ring known as the Society, which is based in Seattle. They have just eliminated Fernando, who is a child trafficker, and they wound up saving they wound up saving a group of Yeezy. Yeezy. But also, you're yeah. still creeping me out right now. Yeah. <laughs> the success of this mission has Z wanting to play with Adeline, his little mouse. Oh God. Tell me more. What does this playing entail? So he wants to go find her. And he finds Adeline and Dea. He sees that they've decided to go to the club. And they are approached by some dangerously attractive men. One man in particular, Arch, Archibald Talavera III. If you want to be specific and detailed. <laughs> Even though I do love that last name. So Arch winds up escorting Addie and Dea up to the loft VIP area where like three of his Inner boys. Inner circle. Yeah. His boys are there. And Addie receives a text message from her stalker Z stating if this man touches her, his hands are going to end up in her mailbox by the morning. <sighs> so romantic. <laughs> Possessive. Much. And, like, they haven't even truly met. Nope. They have not. They haven't had a conversation. And this is the first time he's, like, texted her. Like, like real-time communication. Yeah. Not just, like, leaving her roses or mm -hmm. a note. Addie doesn't take this threat to heart. She kind of wants to push her stalker's buttons. Yeah, Addie definitely gives me Taurus vibes. Just, like, very stubborn, mm -hmm. just, like, hard-headed, is not going to do anything that she doesn't want to do, especially if she's, like, being threatened or feels threatened. She's too prideful. She's just, like... Yeah, and she's playing, like, a very bratty back-and-forth game with a stalker. <laughs> Don't do this. If you have a stalker, <laughs> don't egg them on. Like, common sense is out the window when it comes yeah. to a lot of Addie's choices throughout this whole book. She definitely makes questionable choices throughout, from start to finish. Like, I get very frustrated with her. Like, there's moments I love her, but times like this, I'm just like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Like, what is even the purpose of that? You would be the first one killed off in a horror movie. Right. So Addie winds up taking Arch home. Dea winds up going home with Arch's friend, Luke. So they about to have some one-night stands. Girls night. Get it, ladies? Yes. Get you a man. <laughs> Things start to get very steamy between Adeline and Arch in the sunroom. The sunroom to me seems like a glass greenhouse that's like attached to like the back. Yeah, I was just thinking of like a... Um, like a conservatory porched, Like kind a of porched thing. in like deck yeah. that is completely covered, but it's just, yeah. Like huge and it's, glass windows. Yeah, and there's also, like, the, the ceiling is glass, so it mm -hmm. is, like, a whole glass, like, encounter, like a... Um, enclosure. Enclosure, yes, thank you. This scene is really hot, because there's, like, really, really heavy making out, lots of good dirty talk. Love Arch it. can dirty talk, unlike Grayson. And, like, at this point, I'm kind of like, all right, he ain't so bad. Yeah. I'm like, he's, like, you know... Doing everything right in my book. Yeah, he's for a one night stand. He's like biting her neck. There's some really good fingering, like finger fucking happening to the point where he does get her off. And Arch has Adeline lick the cum off of his fingers. Yep. Love to see it. <laughs> it was hot. No, it was. And just as Arch is about to start eating Adeline out under the stars, there's a very angry knock at. Addie's door. Who could it be? I wonder. Hmm. This... Who, who did Addie piss <laughs> off recently? <laughs> what threat and warning did Addie just completely ignore? <laughs> Let me think about this. Oh, I know. However, this time, Arch does do the gentlemanly thing, and he goes and investigates it. Yeah, and this is something that I can appreciate. The differences between Grayson and Arch. 
Arch was like up and freaking out the door. And he was like, who the fuck is messing up my night? Yeah. I'm going to take care of this. And he did do like the, are you expecting anyone? But it was more out of concern versus like being pissed off. Right, right. But he actually did what I would hope any person, like any guy would do in that situation yeah. versus like Grayson who just was like pushing Addie towards the door being like, go like, check. And cowering behind her. Yeah. And he's like, bitch. And Arch Little is bitch. like, no, stay behind me. He's trying to be, you know, the knight in shining armor here. Which, especially knowing about the message, yeah, you, you go. You go, honey. But also, no. Because <laughs> um, guess what? He never returns. Nope. And she gets another text message from her sh- shadow, Z, stating, consider this a lesson learned. Yep, her, her one night stand went missing off of her front porch. Yeah. And who's to blame? Addie. <laughs> Addie's to blame. <laughs> I know Z's the one who did it, but like. Right. She come was on, born. Girl. Like, come on. Girl. Ridiculous. <laughs> I know. The cops wind up showing up to investigate the missing arch. And thankfully, she calls, like, she calls this in. Yeah. She has called in, like, a few of the other, like, break ins, but unfortunately, in this book, just like in real life, stalking doesn't always get taken seriously by the police. Until something happens like this. Right. Yeah, so Addie, throughout this, like, throughout this early stalking, she has reached out to the police and has put in some, like, reports about, well, there's, like, roses showing up in my house. And, you know, yeah, like you said, cops really didn't take her all that serious. Yeah. And the cop that winds up showing up does know Addie and her family. Like, so she actually has um, a personal connection to this police officer, so he winds up taking it more seriously than some of the other people that have been showing up. He also takes it more seriously because we do find out that Arch is a part of a local crime family. The local mafia. Yeah. (laughs) So, not a great guy. No, he turned out to be quite the opposite. And as Addie's telling this cop friend um, about the previous reports, she finds out that there's no record of them. There's nothing in her file. There's There's nothing. nothing. Yeah, there's nothing showing that she's reported anything. And in Z's point of view, we do find out that he's the one who took Arch, who not only is a criminal, but is very abusive to women. Specifically his ex-wife. Like, he beat her within an inch of her life. And it probably was, like, a common occurrence. So Zade winds up torturing Arch for a good while. We get a very lengthy torture scene, and then has a package delivered to Adeline. Along with another love note, letting Addie know every time she calls the police, she will be punished. So Addie then confines in Dea the next morning about Arch going missing from her house. And from Dea's doing some digging, they actually realize, like, how dangerous Arch was. And Mm -hmm. so she's kind of like, oh, I'm actually glad that you didn't, like, hook up with him. Or things didn't go as far as they could have gone. Later that day, Addie gets some mail delivered. And she finds a mysterious box with no label on her porch. She goes to pick it up, and there is blood seeping out from the bottom. Red flag. And surprise, it's Arch's hands in the box. So obviously, Addie calls Deo, panicking, like any person would. And as she's panicking on the phone with Dea, she finds a note from her stalker telling her not to call the police, essentially, saying, if you call the police, you will be punished. Later, Dea breaks the news that Arch's whole family has been found dead. Coincidence? Coincidence or not? Nah? So a little bit of a time jump. It's been about a week since Arch's disappearance, and Addie has not seen her shadow. She hasn't seen her stalker in all that time. One night, she hears creaking coming from upstairs, and what does she do? She grows, grabs a knife, and goes to investigate. Addie has had a security system put into place because of Dea recommendation. Dea's recommendation of, you need to do something. And she, like, arranges it. You know what? Thank goodness for Dea. Throughout this whole book. Seriously, because Dea is also kind of like, she is a hacker. Yeah. And so she kind of is like, and she's also the sense of reason with Addie. Yeah, she's the She tries. Sense. She tries. She's definitely the one offering, like, the more sensible plans. That and she ignores. That Addie ignores. Yeah, because again, Addie, like you said, giving total Taurus vibes and just being stubborn. And also I feel like this is almost kind of Capricorn-y too. Like, no, I, yes. I know best. 
Yeah. And so now that she has a security system in place, she also is feeling a little safer. She feels that she's more protected. So Addie makes her way upstairs and checks every room as she makes her way to the bedroom where the door is currently shut, which it wasn't before. Red flag. Sense of security, gone. So she enters her room and realizes that no one is in there, but she does see one of Gigi's journals on the ground, which that wasn't there before either. Addie goes over and picks it up, and the only words on the page read, he came for me. Creepy. Like, chills. Like, oh my god, that's terrifying. Yeah. She also notices that the last page in the journal has been ripped out. So there's a missing page in that last journal. Fast forward maybe a day or so. Daya is back over at Addie's, and Addie is having Daya find the police reports and the crime scene photos from Gigi's murder. She's having her friend do some digging. Like, again, Daya is just... She's the, she's the main bitch, man. Yeah. She's... Daya for the win. Yes. Addie is convinced at this point that her stalker was the one to murder her great-grandma, which you mentioned before. She's still kind of gung-ho on that. Addie and Daya both want to find out who Ronaldo was. This was the stalker that Gigi has been mentioning in her stories, mm-hmm. or in her journal entries. Yeah, we finally got his name. We finally get his name, and it's Ronaldo. Daya is going to look into him for Addie, mm-hmm. using her hacking skills. That night, Addie is woken out of her sleep when she realizes that someone is outside her bedroom door. She hears some noises. So what does she do? She Something <laughs> stupid. <laughs> she grabs a screwdriver and then gets out of bed and waits to see if her stalker will come in. So she's not rushing out, but she, she's prepared, I guess. I mean, she should be, like, exiting the window and, like... Something. Going somewhere else. Yeah. At least for a moment. Yes. But he doesn't come in. And she actually hears him make his way down the hall and down the stairs. So then she runs over to her window to see if she can spot him when, she, when he exits the house. Finally, her shadow appears. And he's described as being a very large man wearing all black. Specifically with a hoodie over his head. He's tall and lean and packed with muscle. Like, she can tell that he's definitely, like, built. defined. He's built. He's a big guy. He turns back to the window, noticing Adeline watching, where he smirks at her and walks into the woods. <laughs> Fucking bastard, man. <laughs> oh, my God. And it's something funny, uh, uh, not really, but intriguing, about, like, Addie Stalker and Gigi Stalker, is they're very similar in their approach. Like, they're both very silent, not really speaking, yeah, trying Yeah, because it, it to... took Ronaldo a long time to actually talk to Gigi. Yeah. And, like, he would show up. They would have interactions, but they would be silent interactions. Very similar. It was a, it was a very strange courting ritual that is now happen, happening to Adeline, which is another reason she's, like... I mean, just the parallels between... Super freaked out. It's just a lot. And it is a lot. As a reader, it's a lot. The letter from Gigi that we get at the end of this chapter, her and Ronaldo have, like, started a secret affair, essentially. He is coming to her whenever her husband, John, Gigi's husband, John, is out at work. Whenever she's alone, he starts showing up more and more, and they kind of start an affair. And in this letter, Granny's banging the stalker. Yep. In this letter, Ronaldo has come back after a week of her not seeing him, and he is heavily beaten and bruised he wouldn't tell her what happened but they end up sleeping together for the first time so yeah full-fledged affair at this point but Gigi isn't really feeling any regret she only wants to do it again getting back to Addie two nights have passed with no shadow sightings but that changes when Addie hears a loud thump or some kind of noise coming from the kitchen so Addie, within this time frame, has also learned that her soccer has spliced her security footage the last time he visited, making it appear that he was not there. Yeah, because Daya figured that one out. Because again, Daya is like a really genius woman. She thinks of everything and she has that ability. So she's definitely somebody that you want on your side in this situation. Yeah. So she hears the noise from the kitchen. And as she goes to investigate, she looks out the window and she sees her stalker walking from the woods towards the house. So Addie is now holding a knife and is standing in front of the window, almost haunting him. Like they're literally just staring at each other. Her stalker stops, lights a cig, and they continue their staring contest. Let's play a game with creepy man who you already know has murdered multiple people. Let's antagonize him. So... 
at a point, Addie, finally having some sense, grabs her phone to dial 911, but she sees that her stalker is visibly shaking his head, and that, like, triggers Addie. So she ends up storming outside onto the porch to confront her dangerous stalker, and she asks him what he wants, but he doesn't reply. He just smiles and walks away back into the woods, and only then does Addie realize she forgot the fucking knife when she picked up her phone and went and confronted a psycho with no weapon. And this is where she really starts to piss me off. Why would you do that? Why would you go out and... But something about Addie is she has a fear kink. Yes, and that's becoming more and more evident. As you read, it's kind of hinted at, but like you really actually start to see how much of a fear kink Addie actually has. Mm -hmm. She loves getting off on that fear. Yes. So... She's getting, so even though she's not really getting off on the fear at this, like, right now, She's getting she aroused is. by the danger. Like, kind of once the danger starts to dissipate is when she realizes, what the fuck am I doing? Yeah. Like, oh my god, I am, yeah, because she obviously has instant kind of like, oh my god, I went off Like, instant regret. The weapon. And then she has, like, this instant realization, like, oh my goodness, this kind of got me hot and bothered, and then has <laughs> guilt and regret and... A lot of emotions. Addie feels a lot during this book. A lot. And they're always very conflicting and at war with each other and with sense. Yeah. Crazy. So, three days have passed and Addie is reading and analyzing Gigi's journals when she glances up and boom, her stalker is back standing in the same place that he was at the last confrontation. (laughs) So, Addie contemplates calling the police and notices that her stalker has moved closer to the house. There's a creak from above her, the haunted house, right, makes a lot of random noises. Mm -hmm. So there's a creak from above her, and she pretends that she's calling out to someone. She watches her shadow pull out his phone, and he gives a little smirk. Fifteen minutes later, he leaves, and that's about, that's that. He just, he just leaves. Fast forward, maybe a day or so, Addie has a book signing where Dea picks her up. Dea is very worried. Yes. For Addie. And she is constantly trying to be like, please stay with me. Please stay with me. And Addie's like, no, I need to stay at my house. No one's going to scare me away from my home. My home. Like, I get wanting to stand your ground and, like, not be scared out of your house. But also, like, this is a dangerous situation. This is a proven murderer. Yeah. At this point. You. At least temporarily leave until, like, things get resolved. As Dea and Addie pull up to the house... There's a single light on that Addie did not leave on when she left. Dea tries to talk some sense into Addie, but Addie automatically jumps out of the car and rushes in to confront her stalker, where she sees that the whole living room is filled with roses. They check the whole house, and Addie finally lets Dea talk her into staying with her for the night. About damn time. But, unfortunately, as soon as Addie gets to Dea's, Addie gets a message from her stalker asking her about the roses. Did you not like my flowers? Did you not like them? You're hurting my feelings. End of chapter. So we get another Gigi note. This one talking about how enamored she is with Ronaldo and how happy and beautiful he makes her feel. And she tries not to think about him too much when she's with John because she doesn't want him to become suspicious. As of right now, I think that John has a little suspicion because Gigi has been starting to act different. But as of yet... Nothing has been really... Yeah, because she's starting to, like, retreat out of her marriage. So now we get back to Z, or Zaid. Z hears that there has been a video leak from Jay. And the, on this video, it's showing four unmasked government officials, their senators, I believe, sacrificing a young boy and then drinking his blood in some kind of sacrifice ceremony. And these four guys' names, they're Mark, Robert, Jack, and Miller. Just when you thought the plot couldn't get more twisted. Here we go. So currently, Zay and Z, they don't have any leads. So Z heads to get a drink at Addie's. Because she has, her grandfather's whiskey is like, I guess, a really good whiskey. And it's becoming Zay's favorite. And so he goes, he leaves a rose, he has a drink. Addie's his bar now. Yep. So Z continues to watch the video over and over, getting angrier and angrier. In this 
chapter, you really get some insight on how passionate he is about saving kids from trafficking. But he's also just chilling in Addie's house without her knowledge as she sleeps in the upstairs bedroom. And definitely not her permission. Definitely. She has no idea. So it's like, it's weird because like you're starting to get to know Zade better and you're like, he has good intentions. Yeah, it's like you're starting to root for him because... Of what he does. Yeah, of what he does and just kind of his stance on this horrible real-life thing. And he's actually doing something about it and making a difference. But he's still stalking Addie. <laughs> but he's still a monster. Right, like it's still right. murder. It's still stalking. It's still bad news bears. Like, no. It's very conflicting. Yes. Getting back to the manipulator's point of view, which is Addie. So she's home one night and she actually sees an apparition of a woman who looks just like Gigi going up to the creepy as fuck attic. Which is the one room that Addie didn't have renovated during like the whole house. She like left it. Because she was like, this is creepy. Fuck that. So she makes her way up and notices like every time that they go into the attic, it's always mentioned that like the air and the pressure changing like dark energy. Like just like something weird. Like it's just... And it's even more creepy because, like, wasn't that Addie's grandma's, like, safe space? Yes. This is where Nana hung out a lot of the time. When she needed to decompress, when she needed to think, when she wanted to be alone, the attic was her safe haven. As Addie is in the attic, she ends up finding two more notes. One is a confession about helping cover up Gigi's murder, and it's also, like, an apology. And the other one is the missing piece or the missing page from Gigi's journal. And that says that someone could be coming for her. And if she ends up dead, it was... And obviously, she did not get a chance to finish the freaking note. So frustrating. I almost threw my Kindle (laughs) at that point. Are you kidding me? (laughs) Are you kidding me? Yep, she didn't finish it. And Addie had the same reaction. She was pissed because she's like, are you serious, Gigi? Like, really? Like, you couldn't give us, like, the first initial... I know, right? But also, I can't be too mad because she was probably murdered while writing that. Right, probably. Because I also think that the date was, like, the day of her murder. And so Addie Stalker is back, and he texts her again, where they almost have this, like, flirty kind of banter about her calling the cops and him sending her toes next time. Like, that's the thing with, like, their texts, too, is that there is, like, a flirty sexual kind of banter when they're talking about the most, like, obscene things because again Addie has a fear kink and it's more and more evident and he also in this text conversation calls her out for pretending to have other guys around remember when she yelled up after the creek Mm -hmm. and he checked his phone he was checking surveillance because he has cameras in her house and he can hack into her and he can hack into her own so he knows that she was alone so he's he's calling her out making her know that like you tried to get one by me but I'm better than you And he pretty much actually goads her into calling the cops in this texting exchange, which she does. So a cop comes out, takes her statement, and she gets a text saying, the more she disobeys, the harder the punishment is going. The next day, Addie asks Dea, her number one go-to, if she can trace an unknown number. So Addie has to tell Dea about her stalker's texts. Up to this point, she hasn't really, she hasn't said anything. Now, Daya's pissed about this. <laughs> She's very pissed. And then, unfortunately, the number is untraced. Daya does tell Addie that Luke has been texting her and asking questions about the night of Arch's disappearance because Max is on this rampage to find out what happened to his best friend. And she's just like, join the freaking list. Who isn't after me at this point, you know? So now, not only does she have a stalker, but she has a serious, like, mafia tie yeah, potentially coming after her. Because Max has taken over... From Arch and his family. Yeah, Max is kind of like, he's kind of trying to establish himself as like the Don now. Yeah. So we get another Gigi letter where she writes that she's in a bad mood and that even Frank, who is John and hers like best friend, who's also like a police detective or chief or something like that. And even her friend Frank is picking up on her bad mood. Ronaldo and Gigi had a fight because he didn't like that she was still with John. But his life is dangerous. She doesn't know. It's still a mystery. She doesn't know why his life is dangerous. But she's like, until that's taken care of, like, I can't be in a serious, like, relationship with you. It's like, you can't expect me to leave my husband. Right. Plus, she doesn't want to give up her daughter, Serafina's, who's Nana, her stability. 
because she has a full family right now. And also it's what, like the 40s or 50s? Yeah, it's the 40s. So it's like divorce is not common. Oh, right. And it's like a huge social taboo. Yeah. Day and Addie are talking about a haunted house that is coming to town called Satan's Affair. And it's coming to town for Halloween. It's like a haunted house that moves around the country. And obviously they're going since scary things are Addie's favorite things. <laughs> so Daya leaves and Addie's stalker texts her asking if she is ready for her punishment. And his, his text, she asks him why. Why are you doing this? And his response was, you haunt me, so it's only fair that I haunt you. She's not intentionally trying to haunt him, though. Right. And that she looks beautiful when she's scared. Like, I kind of love it, but I also hate it. I know. So many mixed emotions. He tells her that he's close, and Addie tells him to come out. He replies, come and find me. So Addie grabs her phone and a knife and makes her way back upstairs to find him. She reaches her bedroom door opens the door, and, like, she's not expecting it because he's, he's not hiding. He's just standing in front of her wide-open balcony doors in the middle of the room, waiting for her with a smirk on his face and a blade in his hand. <laughs> I would be <laughs> shitting my pants. <laughs> like, oh, my God. Yeah, like, I would be having the urge to run, and what's Addie's urge? She, like, goes and tries to find him. She crazy. So we get another GG letter. Where Ronaldo took Gigi away for the weekend for a little vacation. She had a wonderful time, but missed her daughter and wished that Serafina could be part of John and her's life and Ronaldo and her's life. We're back, right? We're back in. She is face to face in her bedroom with her stalker. And Addie gets her stalker to lower his hood. And she realizes that she's, she's seen those mismatched eyes before at her book signing. One eye is black and one eye is almost completely white. He also has a nasty scar running down his face. He has a sharp jawline, straight nose, full lips, and short black hair. So he's pretty hot. And obviously Addie... Dangerously hot. Yeah, and obviously Addie is attracted to him instantly because she was attracted to him at the book signing. So he approaches her when she tries to use the blade, but he catches it in his bare palm. So he's bleeding. Like, he's, she's cutting into him. He ends up getting the knife from Addie because he's a professional killer. And he grips Addie behind her neck and brings her closer to him. She's begging him to leave her alone and asks if he's going to kill her. And he pretty much tells her that he has no purpose of doing that because he wants to keep her. This is a long-term scheme, stalking scheme. This is full-blown relationship for him. Yeah, he's ready. Then they play a game of hide-and-seek where he will give her the chance to hide. And if he can't find her, he will go and let her be for the night. But if he finds her, he is going to deliver his punishment. So obviously he says run and she freaking scatters and she hides and her shadow tracks her down. So she tries to make a run for it. She runs for the sunroom, but her stalker predicts the move and beats her there. Cause he's stalking her. He knows what she's gonna do. Yep. Addie says that he's not touching her and fights against his advancements. I mean, Addie is very much fighting him off. There's a lot of heated dialogue from both of these characters as he has her in his embrace and is getting ready to deliver her punishment. Something that I fucking love in this book is there is so much good banter yes. and conversation between these two characters. It's chef's kiss. I'm just like... Because it's very much the conversation I love because I love the bratty dom dynamics and that's a lot of this banter is Addie is a total brat and very combative and doesn't want to submit. And Z is obviously like super dominant. Yeah. And so like they do, they kind of have this back and forth, which is like, I love. And the fact that their banter is just so great. There's just so much that these characters, like how they talk about, I just, I really loved it. They both call each other out. There's no bullshitting with them. Even though there's, like, a lot of bullshitting happening. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's weird and twisted and sexy. Yeah, definitely. Which is just, it sucks because of the premise of this book. I hate that I was so into it. Because I'm like, this is not right. Yeah. Like, the stalking aspect, we can all admit, we, can, we all know stalking is a no-no. That's not something that you should be doing. But I'm just, like, also kind of turned on. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very uncomfy. It is, because then I'm like, is something wrong with me? I'm glad that we're on the same page, because no, nothing's wrong with us. We're fine. 
Because it's like, <laughs> thankfully, this is a work of fiction. So it's like, you can kind of allow yourself to be open to it. Yeah. But not great. So she asks what he's going to do, and he replies, I'm going to claim you. And then he proceeds to bite and leave hickeys all over Addie's body. So mainly, like, her chest and her neck area. Like, he is literally biting. And then, like, kind of, like, licking to massage, like, you know, lessen the, the bite of it. And as much as Addie's brain is saying no, she doesn't actually hate what is being done to her. She actually low-key. So once he's done, he praises her by calling her a good girl. And then she decides to take a big old bite out of his cheek, yeah. making him bleed. Yeah, let's, let's bite the murderer. But Z, low-key likes this, picks her up and carries her fully into the sunroom and lays her down. Addie then notices that he has a gun in his hand, and he pretty much tells her that she let another man touch her, and normally he would replace that with his own touch, but she doesn't deserve it. Because she's being bratty and being a bad girl and not listening. Right, but she does deserve. So then we get another Gigi letter. So John and Gigi are going over to Frank's for dinner for a police banquet. John and Gigi are waiting in silence, and she admits to breaking his heart. So, like, there is now that tension. John has fully picked up that something is different with Gigi. She also makes the comment that Serafina has been a good buffer for her and John recently. But jumping back into <laughs> what's going on with her great-granddaughter... <laughs> I, I, I don't want to because I know what happens. I, I don't I don't want it. I don't oh, right. want it. Well, we're just going to dive in. So okay. her stalker tells her to take off her leggings. And Addie really doesn't want this, but she does. But she does. She She's fighting the whole time during this whole scene. She is actively fighting up to the point that she's not. He traces her thong where she is visibly wet and he calls her out on it. Being like, hmm, someone's enjoying this. He then puts the gun in her face and tells her to suck on it. She gives resistance, but ultimately opens her mouth, and he puts the barrel of the gun, and she sucks on it. He then takes the gun and puts it on her clit, as he also drips spit onto it, and he says, you can never be too wet. Yes, <laughs> you can, first okay. of all. But also, I hate this. Slowly. <laughs> He works the gun inside of Addie. And he pretty much fucks Addie with his gun. And she may mentally hate it, but her body does enjoy what her stalker is doing to her. Because it gets to the point where she is showing active signs. Like, her body is actively showing that she actually doesn't hate it physically. He then rips off her thong, bites her inner thigh... And she's close to coming, and she actually begs him. She doesn't really know what for at this point. She doesn't know if she's begging him to make her come or to stop. It's kind of a mixed emotion up there. He asks her if she learned her lesson, and she obviously sasses back, but then ultimately says that she learned not to let another man touch her, and that the only man allowed to touch her was him. He then makes her touch herself to finish, and she does. He pulls the gun out and licks it himself and then puts it back in his jeans. He then pulls out a rose and drops it on her stomach before turning away and walking away. Which is fucked up. It's like, <laughs> could we at least have gotten some aftercare? Because this was very intense. Some aftercare would have been nice. Yeah, so that happened. Thoughts? Many. Concerning. This is their first sexual encounter, Alex. And he yeah, shoves a gun up her. As punishment for letting another man touch a single lady who doesn't belong to him in any sense. Yeah, it, it it's 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 a no for me. It's a hard no. I did, however, enjoy the panty ripping and the inner thigh biting. I'll give it that. Um, yeah, I can't say that I've ever wanted a gun inside me like that. So no, definitely not my thing. No, that doesn't. Uh, I just no matter how much you lube a gun. That is going to destroy your your vagina. That is going to hurt so bad. Yeah, right? I'm just thinking of like all the different like micro tears that could happen. And like Z is not delicate by no. any means ever. Even though she does have like a fear, she was taken to an extreme and a limit with no way to process it afterwards. Right. In a healthy manner. No. It was just it was a lot of stuff going on. But also still kind of sexy. 
Well, yeah. Which... Because I think that... Which... Ah! It's the writing. It's H.D. Carlton. She knows how to freaking write in a way that even when it's dark material, you are into it. It's fucked up, man. <laughs> I'm feeling a lot of things. And I don't like a lot of the things I'm feeling. I, like, I'm feeling many conflicting emotions at once, just like Adeline was. Same. So for three days... Addie's stalker has stood in her yard watching, but not reaching out in any way. Also, Addie, at this point, has kind of mixed feelings, because she's kind of, like, pissed that he's ignoring her, but also, like, happy he's ignoring her. I think she's more pissed. Yeah. Than happy. Yeah. So Dea and Addie are at lunch, and they start discussing Ronaldo, and they come to the conclusion that he was involved in the mob, and that was his dangerous life. He was involved with the mob family back in the 40s. Then we get a visitor from Max. Max shows up at the table, and he reveals that he knows about the hands, that he actually had people following Dea, and she led them right to the hands that she buried. Addie manages to lie enough to get out of this situation, but they don't feel confident that they have avoided this entirely, this entire situation. So then we get a letter from Gigi. So John got drunk at this dinner. And Frank ended up taking them home and helping carry him into the house since she couldn't do it by herself. John has made a scene and accused Gigi of cheating in front of Frank and all of his work associates. Frank asked her later if it was true, and she said no, but she doesn't think that he believes. So now we're catching up with Z, and he is in mid-stock from Addie's bedroom closet. <laughs> he watches her get ready for bed and settle in for the night. She falls asleep. And he leaves the closet, placing a single rose on her nightstand. He leaves her house. And then he just, like, is just standing around kind of thinking about her. Not really doing anything. And as he's leaving, he gets a phone call from Jay, letting him know that Mark, the guy from the video, the senator, is in town along with all of his colleagues, so the three other men. And they decide that Z has to go undercover and befriend the pedophiles in order to stop the operation. Smart plan. But I don't like it because I don't... You know, now that he is infiltrating this ring, you know you are going to get a lot more in-depth descriptions about a horrible, horrible aspect of this book. And life. And life, yeah. Yeah, just... The shit's real. I mean, sex trafficking is a real thing. So Addie wakes up to the single rose and a text from her stalker. And she's annoyed because he's been back. That night, they engage in some texting, and he tells her that he will be seeing her tonight. Things obviously become sexual in this text message thread, mentioning of handcuff and what he did to her with the gun. And Addie does feel kind of turned on during this text exchange. And Z taunts her. He kind of calls her out about, am I making you? I was kind of turned on. Right? So then Addie tells him to fuck off. And he makes a threat of biting her clit if she says it again. So obviously she does and instantly regrets it, though. Does she? I think she does. I think she instantly is like, fuck. So she calms herself down enough to fall asleep. And then she is slowly awoken up from the feeling of something touching her. And when she wakes up, her mouth has tape over it. And her arms are tied above her head. And her stalker is right between her legs on the bed. Zayd then proceeds to take her underwear off and put them in his pocket. The whole time, Addie has been fighting as much as she can to get away, but her attempts are useless. She's bound and gagged, essentially. But then she feels his mouth on her clit and her eyes uncontrollably roll. And she loves the feeling, but is also disgusted with herself for liking the feeling. So in this scene, we get a lot more of like that internal struggle. He then... Bites her clit like he threatened. And it's constantly a battle within Addie since she hates and loves what is happening. As the scene progresses, she's enjoying it and hating it more and more. Her legs are not bound and he does move and she's able to try to like kick him. But he's disappointed at her disobedience and bites her clit again as punishment. He then asks her what she has learned. And not that a is damn thing. Not a, she didn't learn a damn fucking thing. <laughs> and the lesson is not to tell him to fuck off. He then finally makes her come using his mouth, and she's not necessarily mad at it in this moment. She's actually pretty pleased. He then crawls over her and says, "Swallow your juices," as he spits in her mouth. 
And she does. They then start to heavily make out where, like, they start grinding into each other. And then, like, he kind of jumps away when things start to kind of progress. Once he steps away, shame instantly kind of floods Addie for what she just did and enjoyed. He glances back one more time, biting his lip before leaving Addie alone. Thoughts and concerns about this scene. Yes. So which did you... All of it. Okay, so which did you think was worse? The gun one or this one? That's hard. I know. Because they're really both... Hard. They both involve elements that are equally kind of disturbing. Like, I hate to say this part, but, like, I'm kind of getting desensitized to gunplay. I know. <laughs> How awful is that? <laughs> I mean, I still don't like it. I think that I definitely enjoyed the, like, elements of this one better. Yeah. I Than elements of the other one i just can't get behind the gun and i just think that that's really bad if the consent wasn't as dubious and kind of non-consensual especially in the beginning being woken up that way without having like the conversation that this is something you're into and okay with that really bothered bright side thankfully consent winds up being given later within this scene which strangely then kind of makes it okay in fiction right fiction only not real life. In the gunplay scene, it's like, I don't think she really ever... Fully gives any consent. consent. Yeah. So at least in this one, more consent is given, so I kind of enjoy Okay. Fair enough. I think I enjoyed this one more, too. Not a huge fan of her waking up bound. But I enjoyed more of the elements of the scene better, I think. Yeah. And again, I hate that he continues to get up and leave. Yeah, and he just, like, packs his... Like, he yeah, he literally just, like... Leaves her after all of these scenes. After Especially because, like, from his point of view, it's like he is, he's basically already claiming how he is, like, in love and enamored by this woman. So if you have such strong feelings, why are you leaving her? Right. Because it's like you know you're putting her through these intense situations. Why leave? Like, right. why? <laughs> you're not being a good partner. Right. If you're trying to get, ultimately convince her to want to be in a relationship with you, a consenting relationship. Right. Well, obviously he has issues. So I do want to kind of read an excerpt that I saved because I think that this gives a good kind of into his mind. Just because I just feel like this content is just so heavy and dark that if you're just like listening to us kind of talk about it, you're probably like how the How can fuck you get behind it? Enjoying this. So I am going to read this little excerpt real quick. She hasn't given it to me yet, but she will. I know my little mouse better than she knows herself. She's in too much denial to see how drawn she is to me. If she wasn't, she wouldn't instigate, pushing to get her clip bitten, knowing damn well I stay true to my word. If she generally wasn't intrigued, she wouldn't have texted me back in the first place. Her actions speak an entirely different language than her words, a language filled with desire and pleas. She just hasn't learned to translate it yet. He's not wrong. I mean, he's going about it in a wrong way, but he's not incorrect in his assumptions. Right. So I just thought that that kind of gives a little bit of insight into, like, what he's thinking at this moment yeah. in time. Zay calls Z to talk about Satan's affair since Mark and his crew have purchased tickets. This haunted house is happening in three weeks' time. Z then looks into seeing who else has purchased tickets when he comes across Adeline's name. Z later texts Addie, and Addie asks if he knew that her great-grandma was killed by her stalker. He realizes Addie is trying to put the blame on Gigi's stalker so she can translate that into their situation, and that all stalkers are psycho. Well, <laughs> kind of. Not wrong. As they are having this text chat, Z is watching her from the cameras in her house, Z then calls Addie, and they have a phone conversation about her great-grandma, stalking, and how much she loves being afraid of him. She then asks if he killed Arch. He low-key admits to it, without really saying yes. He goes, what do you think? He gave you his hands. Yes, he killed him. <laughs> and Addie also lets him know about her encounter with Max. She then hangs up, getting fed up with him, because he pisses her off. After this conversation, Z goes to the club slash bar where he knows Max hangs out, and he finds Max having sex with a girl in an open space. He actually shoots a bullet right next to his head to kind of get his attention. Z has gone to confront Max about Addie and Dea, where he tells Max he had something to do with Arch's death. 
He then pulls up a video showing Max's dad pound and gagged sitting in a chair. Z then tells Max as long as he leaves Addie alone, Addie and Daya alone, Daddy Dearest will remain safe. He then tells Max that he can call him Z as he leaves the club. Later, Z shows up to the club called Pearl under the name of Zach Forthright. The club has bad vibes instantly as he kind of walks in, and Z is not a fan of being here and being undercover. Z finds Mark and his posse playing poker, so he approaches them and they deal him in, where he plays at the level of Mark, so not to beat him, but kind of putting up a fight. A younger girl who's drugged comes over to the table and sits on Mark's lap. Z plays into his character. He's trying to convince them that he is also a pedophile and leans in closer to the girl, pushing the glass off the table, making it look like she did it. Z then makes a scene yelling at the girl and drags her away to punish her for being so clumsy. Z leads her to the back where he then gets Jay to send a car for the girl since he is getting her out of there. He's saving her essentially. He then has Jay clear the cameras as he makes his way back to the group to finish out his stakeout mission, essentially. Yep, and trying to build a rapport and get in tight with these society members. All right, so now we get back to Adeline and Dea. They're hanging out, and Addie is venting about being frustrated with Z, like you would to your best friend, about your boyfriend, not your stalker. They get drunk on margaritas and tequila and start discussing Gigi's murder case. Dea is starting to eliminate Gigi's husband, John, and her stalker, Ronaldo, as suspect. And Addie is still projecting and wants the killer to be Ronaldo, so she can continue to hate her stalker. Later that night, after Adeline has drunkenly gone to bed and is still in her clothes, Z shows up in her room. Addie wakes up and decides to talk to Z while undressing and finally asks for his name. Yeah, up to this point, she does not know his name. And she's never even thought to ask him for it. And like, they've done things sexually. And he's kind of like, I was wondering when you were going to ask. Bro, she never did ask. Oh my gosh. Addie. And he finally does provide it. So we find out his name is Zaid. Addie then begins to taunt Zaid about sucking his dick. So he whips it out. And we learn that he is otherworldly large. <laughs> <laughs> like literally otherworldly was the descriptor for his penis. Love to see it. <laughs> I would love to see it. <laughs> So Zaid starts to jerk himself off while taunting Addie right back about being able to handle him and his size. He continues to jerk himself off and slaps Addie every time she talks back to him. With his dick? Does he slap her with his dick or is it his hand? Both. (laughs) And then he makes her swallow his cum and thank him for allowing her to do so. Then he has Addie touch herself and show him that she is wet for him, kind of making her prove to herself that she is attracted and aroused by him. Zaid then licks her arousal off of her fingers, and he leaves. See ya! I'm picking up on a on a trend here. Yeah, make her come and then go. Yeah, right. Come and ghost. Come and ghost. <laughs> come and ghost. Love that. <laughs> Hate it, actually. <laughs> Zaid is back to stalking Adeline, and she's currently working on her book at a restaurant called Bailey's. As he's walking by, he runs into Mark, who convinces Zaid to join him for a drink, and Mark insists on going to Bailey's. Zaid does his best to keep Mark's attention away from Addie, but Mark eventually sees her and takes a picture of her, which pisses Zaid right off. Zaid, being the possessive man that he is, informs Mark that she is off limits as she is his and forces Mark to, like, delete the picture, and he will be double-checking to make sure it was deleted properly. Yeah. Mark then kind of forces an introduction to Adeline, and thankfully Addie catches on for once (laughs) that something is off. Well, I also think that Mark goes up and goes, Adeline, your boyfriend, Zach... Yeah. Who, you know. And then up walks Zaid. Thankfully, she's she's quick to catch on and she does play along. She does. But, I mean, she hasn't been good at reading the room <laughs> for this whole book. Thankfully, she manages it here. Yeah. So she plays along with the angle that she is Zaid, Zach's girlfriend. And it turns out that Mark knew Gigi and his father was the Frank that's been mentioned in the journals. Zaid, Zach, and Adeline wind up getting invited to a dinner party at Mark's home, which is good for Zaid's mission 
and Mark also intends on giving Addie more information about her great-grandmother. Back with Adeline and Dea, she is giving her friend a play-by-play of like everything that happened at the restaurant and plans for the evening of going to dinner at the senator's house. Dea is very suspicious of this and starts to suspect that Zaid is the Z. And Addie's confused as to how and why Dea would think that and like know so much about this Z person and the corporation. And then Dea admits to Addie that she works for Z. So not only is she like a hacker, because that's what, Addie knew she was a hacker. She just didn't know like, exactly who employed her. Right. She didn't really ask a whole lot of questions. Or maybe Dea may, might not have been very forthcoming just because the sensitivity yeah. and nature of what she does. Yeah. So Zaid picks Addie up for their date. Earlier in the day, he sent her a dress and heels to wear for the occasion, which Addie does. She actually listens. Good. No punishments. Just wait. <laughs> While getting into Zaid's car, he's admiring how beautiful Addie is, and she calls him out on it about, like, how he's looking at her, and he responds with, just trying to picture what ring would look best on your finger. Simmer it down, stalker boy. <laughs> so Addie continues to be a brat and mouth off to Zaid, which leads him to, like, having her wear his belt as a collar and having her give him head outside the car and swallowing his cum while he chokes her with his belt. He uses what is available to him. He's resourceful. (laughs) But the thing is, was it necessarily mad at this scene? No, it was, (laughs) it's hot, but like, I'm still so conflicted. So this is the first like encounter, like sexually that I get that like Addie isn't necessarily hating it as much as she had been no she's definitely like she's warmed up to it a little bit now so i think that that's kind of why i like it because it's like the first time we actually see like consent yeah from addy Mm -hmm. like actual consent after this sexual pause they get back in the car and zade gives her the rundown for how to handle the evening explains exactly like how dangerous mark is and what he's involved with and he does confirm that he is dea's boss Upon arriving at the senator's home for this ball, the pair mingle with the guests perfectly. They start making connections, making good impressions. Nailing it. Yeah, doing the whole yeah. schmooze and booze. There you go. They sneak off to the theater room, and Zade gets the bright idea to prove to Adeline that she has a fear kink. So he puts on a horror movie that like hasn't been released yet, so he knows she hasn't seen it. And after about 20 minutes into the movie... He hikes up her dress and starts to finger her. She's also, like, on his lap, I think, at this point, right? Because doesn't he, like, completely spread her legs? Yeah, he, like, moves her, like, onto his lap when he's, like, hiking the dress up. And he has her continue to watch the movie. And if she starts to get distracted or look away, he stops. He removes his fingers, removing her pleasure. Asshole. But I'm also here for this. Because I, mean, I like, yeah. this is very much like a. This is very innocent. Yeah. For this book. Like, this is a very. And especially for stuff we've already seen. Yeah. It's like, normally in romance books, the sex escalates to what we first got, but it's like we started at such a high, intense point. And, and now we're actually getting some like normal sex scenes. Yeah. <laughs> Or, like, normal, like, smuttier scenes. After the detour to the theater, Addie gets to have her meeting with Senator Mark, and she starts to get some more information about her great-grandmother and her murder. A drunken Mark lets it be known that he always assumed it was John who killed Gigi. During the meeting, his phone continues to go off, and he starts to vent about how there's a mole in the society. And this is Mark, right? Yeah. Okay. But things will be taken care of. The pair leave the party, and it is clear Mark is still interested in Addie. Not a good person to be interested in you. Nope, not at all. We get a time jump of a week, and Zaid is helping Adeline learn some self-defense moves. And she's not taking these lessons seriously, even though there's a threat of a mafia coming after her and a human trafficking ring that may want to come after her as well. That are, like, very influential, powerful fucking people. Like, these are the people in the government who have connections. Like, if you disappear, you disappear. Yeah. They both start getting frustrated with the other one. And when the lesson is done, Zaid leaves. Fucking Zaid, and that's his MO. But he does return later that evening because he did lose a girl on a mission. And he wants Addie's company to make him feel better. A rough day at the office. This does soften her like perpetual attitude that she has towards Zade and she does start to cuddle with him and he tells her all about what happened and they spend the night together and it's a very like she comforted him yeah she like 
starts giving him like a massage and like like she's like do you want to talk about it yeah, like, like what's gonna help holds him cuddles him like it's very sweet and tender like it is it's actually like a normal-esque like this scene. is very much yeah. something you would do for your your partner if you were in a committed relationship which is nice to see finally but also i mean he's still stalking her and yeah. it's still not 100 percent like consent like it's still not 100 percent good no like the things that are still happening are not great addie's mother winds up calling again and starts asking about thanksgiving plans and addie takes this opportunity to ask her mother questions about Gigi's murder and so she starts to get a little bit more insight and kind of just confirmation to everything she already knows but from her mom's perspective and kind of how this affected like her her, childhood her childhood and like her grandma now we jump to the ends of fair night so halloween while getting food addie notices a girl is dressed up as a broken doll and is very creeped out by her like but she seems to kind of be like one of the circus carnival workers playing into the whole haunted house creepy vibes right she was just on break eating before her shift started yeah but still kind of being in character right after food Addie and Dea get in line for a haunted house, and behind them in line is none other than Senator Mark, his wife Claire, and the three cronies that have already been identified as being a part of the society. The men take notice of Addie and Dea and are very interested and are marking them as like potential people to steal. Yeah, because Mark and the boys are there looking for people to kidnap and abduct and put into such a fucked up situation. Yeah. Like they're literally hunting for their next victims at this carnival fair haunted house whatever you want to call it yeah mark notices that zaid is not around so he does wind up contacting someone on his phone to set up having the girls kidnapped and like even asks like addy oh so where's your boyfriend and she's like oh he's here thankfully she is smart in this Mm -hmm. instant it's like oh he's here he's just in the bathroom and you know one thing that i do like even though there are a lot of red flags with zade and addy's like relationship zade is always very upfront with her about Mm -hmm. like the situation that like he is in that like she is in he never lies to her no and he's very about himself and his intentions right and like it's really important that like he does tell addy like how dangerous like mark and all these people are because if he didn't this could have gone down so different so it's just it's good to see that he's actually like telling her what's up and not trying to like sugarcoat things it's good she's actually listening and that she's listening because like even zade has been like you think i'm a monster but I am not. To you, He's they like, are the monsters. Like, you will always be safe with me. He's like, I will never hurt you. Hurt you. Mm-hmm. Past the, you know. Past the pleasure kind of hurt. Right. But like physically, like really, really hurt. He would yeah. never, yeah. So Addie and Dea wind up entering the haunted house. And Mark and the Creepers are made to wait, thankfully. Because it's like they only let so many people in at a time. It's kind of like a normal ha- haunted house. Yeah. To so space like as, things. So like as two people exit two people can enter. Thankfully, they were able to get some distance. Yeah. <laughs> Zaid enters. He's he's already been on the premises. Like, he's has eyes and ears everywhere, so he is aware he's scoping. of, like, this whole Addie, Dea, and, like, the creepy fucks. So he's, you know, beelining it to intercept. So he tries to play nice with Mark, even though he has witnessed everything that previously transpired. He knows about Mark setting up Addie and Dea to get taken. When he's able to enter the haunted house, Zay does what he can to ensure Adeline and Dea make it out safely. However, he gets apprehended by the creepy doll girl who has her own mission and has been on the lookout for creeps herself. So she sees Zaid in stalker mode. Watching over Addie and Dea. And it kind of thinks that he's a bad, bad guy stalking yeah. them. And it's like he is a bad guy, <laughs> but he's not the worst person right. in this situation. Thankfully, Addie and Dea made it out of the haunted house safely and they are able to continue to enjoy the carnival. Towards the end of the carnival haunted house thing, Dea wants to take a break and Addie decides to go into the House of Mirrors alone. And it's, like, also kind of towards the end of the night. Yeah. So it's, like, it's probably reaching, like, midnight, 1 o'clock. Yeah, it's, like, I think there was, like, 30 minutes left before the carnival closed. Yeah. And Dea's tapped out. So making her way through the House of Mirrors, Addie's ever-present shadow, Zade, enters. He starts to toy with her and hunt her down, which turns into a fun little game. It's like a cat, cat and mouse game. And this game is... Run. If I catch you, I get to fuck you. So Addie's trying to escape the House of Mirrors. 
And she's gone to this Satan's Affair thing every year for, like, years, m- multiple years. So she's kind of familiar with how, like, to navigate this maze. And it's a cat and mouse game. Like, every time she starts to make progress, like, she'll see Zade in the mirror. And this keeps happening to the point where, he, of course, Zade is going to catch her because... He's Zade. He's better at this than she is. Yeah, he does this for a living. And this is, like, what he thrives off of. So he catches her, and he is going to fuck her in the House of Mirrors. And during this, too, like, you get a lot of that good banter between them. They actually kind of start working through some of their trust issues about their relationship through this. Like, as he starts to, like, take her clothes off and... Yeah, because I also think that, like... Addie is slowly kind of realizing, like, his true intentions mm-hmm. are actually that he does like her. He isn't actually out to hurt her. So I think that she's actually, like, during these conversations in this scene specifically, that is growing. Mm-hmm. And that there is going to be torture with the pleasure. But, but it would never hurt her past the point of, like, pleasure. Yeah. They wind up being in this house of mirrors for two hours. It's two hours before Addie comes out. Like, I want to know how long they were actually chasing each other. Because it seems like she was in the haunted house for about 20 minutes before Zayd made his appearance. No. Yeah. And then it's like, it seems like he lets her kind of sweat it out for a hot minute. Yeah. And like, that cat and mouse type of thing. But yeah, they are in that house, that haunted house for two hours. And it's, it's intense, like... He is, the sex scene is very, like, they are using the mirrors to their advantage. I mean, he's, it's a good sex scene. It's very in-depth. It's very, it is good. And there is, like, that consent. I Mm -hmm. think that she does kind of give in and is like, yes, I kind of want this. Yeah, it's like the, you know, he makes her say his name. And it just hits so many boxes of things we enjoy in reading a good consensual sex scene. Yeah, and I mean, this chapter is pretty much the sex scene. Yeah. Like, this whole chapter is just this, like, mirror-chasing fucking scene, and it is, like, ten, if not more, pages of content for just this one scene. So there is so much going on in this, and it's great. I loved every minute of it. And then, like, you know, she she comes out all disheveled, and she, like, tries to fix herself, and then, like, she does go and meet Dea back at the car, and she gets in, and Dea's like, why do you look and smell like sex? And also, where the fuck have you been for two hours? I've been worried sick. Yeah, Dea was freaking out, as a good friend should be. Yes. Oh, they do have a a birth control chit-chat on this one, though, as well. It's it's mentioned that she is on birth control. Yeah, because he he mentions about, like, her being the mother of his children. Yeah, coming on real hot. Like, he is informing her of all of the plans that he has for the two of them for the rest of their lives and how they're going to be together forever. She's it for him. And she just needs to accept it. Great sex scene. And I'm so happy that this was the first one. I Like, the first full-on f- sex scene. That didn't make me fully uncomfortable. Yeah. There were elements where I was still like, eh, iffy. This is a little still iffy, but A no. little intense, a little much. But also, we I'm, I've gotten used to that at this point, knowing who, having a better understanding of who Zayd is. Yes. So, Zayd finally returns to the psycho girl after fucking Adeline in the House of Mirrors. Also, good on him for his stamina. Seriously, this guy is invincible. Like, the fuck? Do they make men like this? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think I've ever met one. <laughs> We're not supposed to meet them. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> and so he returns to the psycho girl where she has all four men captured and tied up. Z and the little girl knocked them out. Unfortunately, Claire, Mark's wife, was a witness to the entire thing. And they kind of took care of her because she was also an abused woman. So Zaid is looking out for her. After they take care of her, Zaid obviously rushed to be with Addie. The girl dressed as the doll is very peculiar. And Zaid picks up on this pretty quickly when he realizes that she has henchmen who are not real. <laughs> so she's definitely mentally ill. She has yeah. some kind of trauma, some kind of mental something. And clearly she's been through some shit because she also has this mission vendetta to like take out men take yeah. out bad guys and so the doll is pretty excited to start killing so Zade kind of gives her the all clear to start with her demon slaying as he calls it and she takes down robert very quickly 
like very brutal, insane stabbing. Like she's the energizer bunny of stabbing. Yeah, and it's like it's so much that Zade is actually like he has to stop her because it's too distracting. So he asks her her name, which she replies is Sybil, but her friends call her Sibby, which is kind of sad because Zade's like. She you don't have, have friends. friends. <laughs> and so once he gets Sibby to calm down, he starts his interrogation on Mark. And Mark starts out by saying that he has no idea about anything, obviously. Which then starts the torture phase. Where I think he starts by plucking out his fingernails. Yep. One at a time. And it doesn't take long for Mark to start spilling the beans. He mentions a dungeon in which, in which Z needs to be able to access in order to get the children. But throughout this whole time, Mark kind of stops giving him information. So... You get torture throughout this whole scene. As you're getting information, torture is being thrown out. Mark ultimately confirms what they do to the children and the government's involvement. Sybil gets impatient and wants to play, as she says, and asks Z for permission. I really don't like her version of playing. I prefer Zade's. And so Zade agrees to let her have her fun with Jack and Miller. So she goes to town on murdering them as well. Z then asks Mark about Addie and why the society has their eye on her. Z then learns that Addie has actually already been marked and it was just a matter of time before the society tried to kidnap her. So, I mean, thank goodness Zayd is stalking Addie and and obsessed with her because... She needs someone to look out for. Yeah. Otherwise, she probably would have been taken a while while ago. ago. So, during this interrogation, Zayd has thoughts of using Sibby as a scapegoat, but ultimately really can't offer up a mentally ill girl. Like, he wants to protect her. He finishes his interrogation... And he punches a knife into Mark's pelvis, killing him. So Sibby ultimately ends up taking the blame for the murders. They chopped up the bodies into pieces and put them into the trunk of his Mustang. And it wasn't long before the cops pulled up. But Sibby refused to get in the vehicle. I think it was because of her henchmen. They weren't there or something. Yeah. So he dips and leaves Sibby to the police because he has dead bodies in his trunk. And if she won't get in to allow him to help her escape, then that's kind of on Sibby. Yeah. We then learned that Sibby was actually born in a cult and was actually wanted for the murder of her father, who was the head person of this cult on this compound. And to kind of give you an idea, she stabbed her dad 153 times. Energizer Stabby. Sibby has actually been going around the country with Satan's affair and murdering people. And her body count is at roughly 50 at this point that they've kind of tracked down and put on her. Z and J have been keeping a closer eye on Addie now that he knows that the society's after her. Z shows up to Saviors, which is the bar or club in which they perform these rituals at, supposedly. Or so Mark says. Mm-hmm. J informs him that there are a lot of high high profile people, including the president in attendance. Z enters the room. He gets approached by Daniel Bovary, who is the lawyer to the president. And they talk about the deaths of the four senators as Dan kind of seems like he's gauging Zach's reaction. And Zach says, or Zade, you know, Zach Zade. His says, alias. His alias. This. He says all the right things, talking about the murders and how it was just a wrong time wrong place kind of situation with the four senators and then dan asks if z is going to be initiated into the club z plays the role that he needs to in order to convince dan that he has acquired tastes and shows a picture of a victim he saved five years prior to kind of really sell this dan then shares that the society has had a spy leaking videos but they're confident that they have that person detained and that it's it's no longer an issue we catch up with Addie as she's in a dark room watching the news about the four government officials who were killed at the haunted house. They show a mugshot of Sibby, and obviously Addie recognizes her. She's also pissed that Zade fucked her and then went and murdered a bunch of men with a psychotic chick. Like, Addie, <laughs> get your priorities freaking straight. <laughs> she's also trying to talk herself out of all the feelings that she's feeling towards Zade at this point, where she then catches sight of Zade and starts to panic looking for her phone as she dials 911. Z comes up behind her and snatches her phone. He's like standing behind her. She's telling him to stop, yet her body's reacting without her permission and she's arching into him. He ends up pushing her up against the wall and kissing her where she reciprocates until she can finally get her thoughts kind of back and she tells him to stop and calls him a monster because he just murdered these men. Really? He only murdered one. Right. He just disposed of the bodies. Justified? It was a very justified murder. Right. These were horrible, horrible men. Yes. Addie then knees him right between the legs and he manages to miss the brunt of it but gives her enough room to slip out and run. 
She sprints out into the front yard towards the woods as it's pouring rain out. She's hoping that she can get away. She ultimately gets a little turned around in the woods, but she can hear Zade somewhere near. He then closes in and tells her that there is no escaping him. Addie is full thrashing, fighting, trying to get away. Most of this is stemming from the fact that he just murdered people. And so they have this conversation about it. And he's kind of like, is it bad that I kill pedophiles and rid the world of one evil person at a time? Like, so he's kind of like, why are you so mad that I killed bad guys who are after you? They actually have a sweet moment here because Addie can tell that Zade does feel bad that he wasn't able to protect her. And she kind of comforts him because he's kind of putting the blame on himself for like the society being interested in her. They have some more conversations surrounding these topics and he finally releases her pinned up wrists and rips the shirt right off of her, right down the middle. Yep. Love to see it. Love it. Look at that strength. I mean, he's already displayed it time and time again. Yeah. And obviously, Addie is liking this. Her body's liking this. but I'm she's, liking it. Right. She's still not 100% in it in her head at this point, though. And she even says that she can make herself come better than he could. And so he asks her if she's prepared to prove it. So he's holding her down and pretty much demands that she touch herself and see how hard that she can make herself come. She does talk back, where then he delivers a sharp slap right on her clit. She doesn't want to, but she slowly slides her hand down, and that's exactly what Zaid has asked of her. Once Addie starts getting going, she's not all that mad, but she's still kind of fighting it. Addie gets herself to come and he asks, was it better? And she nods, even though she's lying and he calls her out. He asks her again if it was better and she says no. He orders her to get up where he then wraps her legs around her waist and he's going to remind her how good it feels to be his. Z then starts carrying Addie back to the house and she actually starts kind of teasing him by kissing his throat and licking him, Mm -hmm. stuff like that as he's carrying her. So now she's the one instigating. Yes. She also rewards him with some bites and asks him, what's wrong? Can't handle what you dish out because she's starting to kind of mark him. Damn brat. Yep. So she nips his neck again, adding to the fire. And ultimately he pins her against the tree and just fucks the shit out of her. He can't wait. He continues his trek back to the house, but instead of going in, he heads towards Addie's SUV and dumps her and himself in the back. They Again, then, the stamina on this man. It's unworldly. Just like his penis. Seriously. They have a conversation briefly about how Z thinks Addie is in denial about how she actually feels. Addie is completely naked while Z is totally dressed. And they start heavily making out. And Addie, at this point, kind of just gives in. She's tired of resisting the temptation. And she wants him. So she kind of starts like clawing at him, ripping his clothes off. He then has her put half, like the front half part of her body through the two front seats. So her ass is like just in his face. And he also uses the seatbelts as like ropes or ties around her arms so she can't move. I was trying to like picture this, like the logistics of it. It took me way too long to figure it out. (laughs) Yeah, logistically, probably not something that is an easy thing, like with the ropes and everything, but he's handy. And you know what? If anyone could do it, he could. Yep. He lifts her ass up and goes in like it's his last meal. (laughs) Love it. Once Addie comes, Zade obviously undoes her hands, flips her back so that she's on her back in the back of the seat, in the back seat of the car. Without warning, he just enters her full force and he's huge. And Addie is a smaller chick. So she is like, oh my God, like, holy fuck, like, Too much, too much. Rearrange my organs. And then he says, remember this? Because the next time I fuck you, you'll be deeply in love with me. Well, full of yourself there, Z. And then they also, surrounding this, they have some witty banter kind of going on. And, like, the car is full on rocking. Yeah, they're back and forth. And I love that they, like, have these back and forth moments, like, while mid-session. Yeah, it's great. It, like, adds to it. I love it. I love to see it. So then Z flips her back around so she's straddling him, and he tells her to ride him. But he's so big that Addie is a little terrified, and it takes her a while to fully get seated. (laughs) Now she is about to come again, and he whispers, let me feel you fall in love. (laughs) Oh, my God. Yeah, that kind of was, like, really gross. <laughs> right. But then they both do come with her, and his name is on her lips. Her name is on his lips. Like, it's a cute whatever. Like, it's one of those weird, like, it's hot, but I also was cringed out by it. I mean, a lot of things that Z says is cringy. They are so cringe. But I don't hate it in this context. No, like, it works. 
It shouldn't work, yeah, but it does. it does. But like that scene, there was just so much incorporated. That was it my lasted favorite forever. sex scene. Me too. I think so. Hands down. I think it just had so many elements. I just was here for it. Through and through. Same. That was definitely Brimo. Top tier. Mm. So then we get a note from Gigi where she is now starting to express true terror. She is starting to express that somebody is upset that she is wanting a divorce from John. And this person is aggressive and says that they own her and that no one else can have her but him. She doesn't know what to do and she's scared. So things are starting to escalate with Gigi as well. So it's the next morning when we... um get back to Addie and Zaid. They're outside on the balcony drinking their morning coffee where Zaid is internally talking about how much his dick hurts because of how many times him and Addie like went at it the previous night. Love. Love, love, love. We also learn, unfortunately, that there was another video that has been leaked late last night. And this video, Z recognizes some of the gauntlets that were used for the ritual that he saw in the club at Saviors the night before in this video. So he's taking it really hard because he was there and didn't do anything. So Z also likes to bring up baby talk first thing in the morning to Addie. And she's just kind of like, she shuts it down. She's like, you need to stop that nonsense. Yeah. Like, it's like she hasn't even admitted to being your actual girlfriend, not just your fake girlfriend yet. Let's hold off on the baby talk. They then talk about Gigi and how she fell in love with Ronaldo and how maybe they're like reincarnations of Gigi and Ronaldo. And Z pretty much says that he would find her in any lifetime. Yep, he'd haunt her throughout time, space, any and every existence. <laughs> and so Zayd is still with learning about this video. He is in the negative kind of headspace. So something triggers him where he grips Addie by the neck and kind of like leans her over the balcony where she's freaking out at first, but then shows trust in Z, which he really likes. Like, this is the first time that he's seeing that maybe Addie is starting to trust him. Which, like, isn't necessarily a good move to make if you want someone to trust you. Like, let me show you I can murder you. So then Addie asks Z if he's okay because she notices that he's a little off. And so he then confesses and tells her about the, the last video that's been leaked. She asks if he needs to talk about it, and they have a more discussion on like his job and stuff like that we learn that z has been targeting pedophile rings trafficking anything like that for the past like five years now five or six years and he goes into a lot more detail mm -hmm. about like mark and everything like that we also learn that he did not have any kind of traumatic upbringing that led him to this lifestyle he had two very loving parents who died in a car crash when he was 17, but he just feels the need to help people who can't help themselves. So there's Thrill no murder. Right. But there's no like real like triggering point that like made him this person. Yeah, no, he just, it was one of those, he learned that trafficking existed and, you know, pedophiles existed and it bothered him so much that he was like, I need to do something. So they have some more in-depth conversations. And the last question that Addie asks is about the roses. And Z does confess that the roses were his mom's favorite flower and that she always had them around the house. And so he wanted to give her roses because she feels like home to him. Which I actually thought was freaking sweet. Was. I was like... That was like a heart melt yes. moment. So I don't get many of those in no, this book. So no. that was like a welcome. And then Addie pretty much says that she hasn't accepted everything in, with Z. And it might take her some time, but she's willing to try and kind of be in a relationship. They're in the middle of a conversation that's leading to maybe something sexual when all of a sudden we hear Dea come in and she is confronted face to face with her best friend and her best friend's stalker. And her boss. And her slash boss. Obviously, Dea is smart and knows that this is her stalker. And then Z reveals that he is her boss. So she now knows. I liked it. He's like, mm, you may want to be careful what you say next because I do sign your paycheck. I mean, a dickhead comment, but like it was funny. Right, it was. Z leaves Daya and Addie alone and Daya kind of comes out asking Addie all the important questions surrounding Z. Because Daya is the smart one. Addie comes clean and has to tell Daya that she lied about Z's identity when she asked about it at Satan's affair. 
But thankfully, she's able to tell Dea everything now, including, like, Mark and the society. Dea, being the great friend she is, pretty much tells Addie she doesn't understand the relationship, but she isn't mad, and that Z does really great things, and that she admires him and his work for, like, what he's doing for people. And obviously, she's part of it, so, like, she is on his side. Addie then asks Dea if she's heard anything from Max, and she says no. Dea picked up an envelope that was on the floor that has like a handwritten tag on it, no stamp. It looks like it was something that was like hand delivered. They open this envelope and there are dozens of photographs along with a note that come out of it. Gigi is the person featured in these pictures, but they don't recognize a man that's in almost all of these pictures as well. As the dates get closer to the death of Gigi, they can visibly tell that her demeanor has changed and she looks like curled in on herself and that, you know, her smile is strained, like something you can tell has been affecting her. They read the note, which pretty much is someone confessing their love to her and saying that they have waited so long to be with her, but she has chosen yet another man instead of him. And the only thing that this person can think of to do is by cutting her out of their life to end the misery for good. And it's signed by your true love. Creepy. So Addie mentions that this guy in the picture looks familiar and they end up doing a reverse image search online where they realize that this man is Mark's father, Frank, who is the police detective. Now both Addie and Dea are thinking that Frank was potentially the murderer. Day is still a little not sure. She looked into Ronaldo, and he died in 1947 of a pretty much of a broken heart. So it's kind of seeing less, seemingly less and less that he was yeah. the murderer. So Addie does the only thing that she thinks will help, which is to head back to the attic because she thinks something's there. Let's go to the creepy haunted attic. So as they're in the creepy attic, Addie notices something a little weird behind something or if it was like in the wall again or something like that. So she reaches her hand in, she grabs the contents of whatever this is and both her and Dea bolt out of the attic because they are both getting these really creepy vibes still. They should have renovated the attic. They really should have. They're back downstairs and it's a Ziploc bag that Addie has pulled from the attic. There is a gold diamond encrusted Rolex that is streaked with dry blood. And there's also a note that says no one can know that this happened. Dea, being the smart bitch that she is, knows that you can track watches by the serial number so she can look into whoever is the owner of this watch. But unfortunately, it was so scratched out. But Dea has some connections, so she's confident that she can get that serial number. In the next letter we get from Gigi, which is slowly creeping up to her death date. She writes that she's going to die and that he is coming for her and all she can think of is her daughter because she's only four, she's only 16 and she doesn't know how to have a conversation with her to tell her that she might not be around much longer and she blames herself. So Gigi's letters just keep getting sadder and sadder. Yeah, this whole book starts to get sadder and sadder at yes. this point. Z is still fuming about the last video that was leaked by the society When he's on the phone with Jay, he actually gets a call from Dan, who has a favor to ask. Dan has invited Zach slash Zaid to a preliminary initiation dinner on Friday in preparation for the initiation on Saturday. Daniel lets Z know that the appetizer has been picked out specifically for him, which means the appetizer is a little girl. Based off of the photo that he showed earlier. And Z says he wouldn't miss it for the world. On the night of the initiation, preliminary initiation dinner, Z makes sure that Zay is watching Addie. Z reaches Daniel's house and enters. Dan greets him. And as Z is taking in the decor, which is very, ter- very terrifying. He has this abstract piece that is a little girl who's crying blood. Yeah, and like the, the foyer. The, art, the artwork in this, terrifying. Terrifying. So scary. Like, very creepy. So Daniel asks Zach, Zaid, to sit next to him for dinner. Z's very tense, and he hates this whole situation that he's in. But five minutes later, the kitchen door opens, and dinner is served. So Dea is back over at Addie's as they're spilling over journal entries and notes and pictures. They still don't know who sent the mystery envelope. Dea's phone rings and it's a woman calling back about the sample that was sent in, which was the blood on the watch. They got a match and it's confirmed that it was Genevieve Parsons, AKA Gigi. So Dea has also sent in some samples of Frank's handwriting to see 
if it's a match with the note that was left with the, the Rolex, they both open the letter and it's a confirmed match. Dea also reached out to her friend to decipher the serial numbers and it was tracked down that the buyer was Frank. So the watch and the writing, Frank, the blood, GG's. Dea then tells Addie that Frank's handwriting wasn't the only sample that she sent in. Essentially, the handwriting in the confession note matches Addie's Nana's handwriting. So they believe that Frank threatened her and she felt that she had no choice as that he was a detective. So Addie's Nana has been holding onto this secret for about 75 years up until she died. She lived to be about 91 and she was 16 when this happened. It's a long time. Long time. And then it winds up making a lot of sense as to like why Addie's grandma and Addie's mom had a strained relationship. And it also makes sense as to like why maybe Nana went to the attic so often. Like, that was kind of, you know, she felt probably mad guilt. But she really didn't. Like, what do you do in that situation? Like, that is a tough situation for a 16-year-old to be in. Yeah. And then not only is the person that murdered your mom police officer, then his son winds up being a senator. Like, right? They're were they power- really going to yeah. get justice for this? No. no. So after this realization, Addie and Dea get a little drunk. And Addie ends up going to bed sad and drunk and missing Z. She knows he's off doing something dangerous tonight, and she's also worried about him. She also starts thinking about how long it's been since he started stalking her, which is about three months. She feels uncomfortable, so she strips down, and she's only in a matching bra and panty set, and she pretends Z is there as she starts to touch herself. But once she's done, it isn't that euphoric feeling that she normally has. She's just feeling more sad. Because it's not Z's touch. In the next letter we get from Gigi, she's talking about death and how it's the only thing that she can see these days. He won't leave her alone and she's pleading with him. She's begging for her life. She pleads that she can't be taken away from her daughter. If she tells the police, would they believe her or would they believe him? She sounds very hopeless and doesn't understand why he's doing this to her because she trusted him. So we're back at the dinner party with Z and Daniel. After a little girl was brought into the dining room as an appetizer. Fringe. This is terrifying. Gross. gross. Hate it. Hate it. Hate it. I hate this whole. Hate it. I hate all this. Daniel then says that they are sacrificing her and they drink the blood afterwards. But Z interrupts by saying that you don't get to have a little fun first. Daniel requests the girl be brought towards Z where Z asks her her name, which is Sarah. And he has her sit on his lap. During this whole time, he is feeling sick. And this is only intensifying because Sarah so has to play this part. Right. And I think that it's also intensifying because Sarah is also looking at him like he's an abuser. So like it's really getting to him. But he knows it has to be done. He does lean in and whisper, you're safe with me. Just keep quiet to Sarah. Z then makes a show saying he wants privacy with Sarah, but Dan wants a show. But Z being Z doesn't let that fly and says that he doesn't share. So Dan does allow them to leave. As this interaction is going on, Z has pushed this little button on like his watch, I think, that will cause a distraction for the event, something that Mm -hmm. he has set up. So, So there's a knock on the door and Daniel goes to open the front door and it's the FBI. It's the FBI. And all hell kind of breaks loose. Z ends up taking Sarah and convinces her that she, that he is on her side. And she asks if he is taking her back to her parents. She asks if her parents are alive, which Z doesn't understand really why. That would be a question, but he says he doesn't know. And then she asks if her parents aren't alive, if Z would be her new daddy. Which is just like really sad. But it was also really sweet too. It was. And this like interaction was like very tender and, like, Z is actually really considering it. And he's like, oh, but I but I need to talk to Addie because that would make Addie the mommy. And I need to right. make sure she's all right with this. Right. But before he can answer, Ruby shows up and whisks Sarah away from this horrendous scene. And Sarah asks if she will see Z again. And he says yes. And as she's walking away, she looks back one last time. And he's he's a goner. He's kind. She's kind of wrapped him around her finger. An agent then comes up behind Z and escorts him back to the house. Dan apologizes and says that Zach slash Zade has nothing to do with any of this nonsense. And they're both escorted out of the house into the back doors of the waiting FBI cars. The agent who has Z is Michael, who's actually a guy who works with Z, because obviously this whole thing was a setup. Yeah. It was a whole ploy, right? And so Michael is actually one of, like, his mercenaries. But it, they're setting it up so it looks like Zade is also getting arrested. Right, because Zade is taken down to the police station where he's instantly 
let go. And he has the whole thing kind of planned out how this whole thing will trickle down with, because he has friends in the FBI, so they can sign some things and whatever. So Z's been released from the police station since, since he was never really arrested to begin with and makes his way back to Addie's house where he finds her passed out, drooling and snoring, looking all cute. Z then strips down and slides into bed next to her. He's contemplating having sex with her while she's asleep, but thinks better on it. Thank and goodness. So he does say, and this is a quote I pulled, he said, although I've taken advantage of Addie on several occasions yeah at least her being awake and coherent allowed me to watch her body's reactions doesn't make it right but her body has always worked for me and if it ever didn't I wouldn't have touched her until it did which like I I don't I don't like it but I kind of do but I really don't so Addie wakes up and they have some conversations about like his tattoos. The main thing that I kind of got out of this conversation was him being like, the things on my body don't mean anything. It's my possessions that I acquire, meaning her. Like she is what matters to him. And he's kind of like confessing this, that like he's kind of like- He's head over heels in love with this woman. Z then manages to flip Addie so that she's on top of him. So she's kind of straddling him laying down in bed. And he can feel how wet she is through her silk underwear. He then orders Addie to sit on his cock. I think he literally says, sit on my cock. <laughs> yes. Then Addie decides to tease Z a little bit. And Z is getting a little annoyed. But she ends up throwing, like, the ultimate curveball when she calls him baby. And she knows that she is in control. Like, she now knows, I think, how much control she has over him. Mm -hmm. Because he freezes up. He wasn't expecting it. And, like, she picks up on that. Addie then sinks down onto his cock and starts riding him. Z suddenly jerks her off and tells her to run. And there's a second where they're both frozen, but then Addie jumps into action and bolts out of the room. Addie's running towards the sunroom again, and so Z grabs her and carries her off to the room, where he then says this line, which is, Let me know which stars you prefer. The ones above you or the ones I make you see? I really like that. I really liked that, too. <laughs> I was like, yes, honey. <laughs> Talk like that more often, please. Right? And then he is diving into that pussy. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's even how it's written. He wraps his hand around her throat and orders her to give him another one. Orgasm. As her face pinkens because he is choking the living shit out of her. Because, again, he has an otherworldly dick. So. Yes. They both lose themselves and come, and the stars surrounding them suddenly look dull and lifeless compared to the ones shining in her eyes. That's kind of what he says afterwards. Zane and Addie are lying, out, are lying around after their orgasms, and Z tells her that he has an extraction tomorrow and that it involves the ritual. He does mention Sarah, the little girl he saved earlier, that evening and the fact that she asked if it would be if he would be her dad. Addie then asks if he would adopt her, and he responds by saying he wouldn't do anything without getting her permission because if he's the daddy, then she's the mommy. Again, moving real fast here. Real fast. It's only been three months, people. Like, it's been three months. And they haven't even officially been together no. in a relationship. Not at all. Maybe for a week now because Addie's kind of accepted it. Yes. So Z has made it outside of Saviors on Saturday night for the initiation ritual, where Z is asking if he's ready for it. Z enters the club and is greeted by Dan. Dan apologizes again for the inconvenience with the FBI. Z is then lounging around for a few hours waiting for the ritual to begin when Dan graces their presence once again saying that it's time and leading them down into the dungeon. They are led through this like hallway that turns into this like open dungeon area where Dan orders him to grab a robe and put it on. There's an older gentleman, gentleman there by the name of Larry, who is also another initiate. Dan leads them to where they need to go in order to begin the ritual, where there is a little girl strapped down on top of the dais, and she couldn't be more than six or seven. And she's obviously, like, crying. She's She's about terrified. to get sacrificed. Yeah. Since Mark kind of gave way for all the information about this secret dungeon, Z was able to have his own people infiltrate the security detail so he knows that he's not totally alone in this situation. There's another younger guy standing next to Z who Z declares is the first to die when the time comes because he is a pedophile. And yeah, he is very... He's very excited about this. Very excited. Fucking people are sick. Yeah, this is disturbing. Single person in a cloak 
with their face hidden approaches with a knife, signaling one of the initiatives to grab it. And obviously Z is going to be the first one to grab the blade, and he walks up to the altar, but instead of stabbing the child, he stabs what he calls the frat boy, that younger guy, in the neck. Gunshots start ringing out, and the whole room bursts into action. Michael comes out from the shadows and flings him a gun. Z leans over, over the girl and helps her get untied and hands her off to Michael so that he can take her to Ruby and to safety. Michael nods and takes the little girl, and Z is about to get into the action when there is a huge eruption or explosion. It's a bomb that has gone off. Mm -hmm. The force is so much that he gets thrown back, hitting his back against the dais and taking some pretty big impact. And this is like a stone dais, so he's literally like almost freaking back broke by stone. Yeah. His vision is starting to clear a little bit when he notices Jay approaching him. Jay is normally always behind the scenes, so this is very shocking, and we find out that Jay has realized that this whole initiation was a ploy to trap Z. The video that was leaked most recently was a setup. Then there comes a voice from behind them saying that they're glad that they could figure it out and to put their hands up, and what's left here is Zay saying, you, and that's all we get, right? Yep. Cliffhanger number one. Cliffhanger number uno. We flash back to Addie, and she is on the phone with her mom as she pretty much tells her mother all about the findings regarding Gigi and Nana. Frank has officially been declared the murderer of Genevieve Parsons, his motive, unrequited love. Addie and her mom are talking about her Nana. We then realize that Addie's mother has also known about the secret that Nana was covering up. Somehow she found out. They hang up and her thoughts automatically go to Zaid and hoping that he's okay. And she is finally admitting that she's slowly falling in love with her stalker. She enters the kitchen and notices a single red rose on the counter giving her some peace of mind surrounding Z. Addie is then woken up by Dea through a series of text messages asking if she will come over, saying that something is upsetting her. She tries calling Dea, and it goes automatically to voicemail. After a few attempts, Addie gets out of bed and quickly gets dressed and runs out of the door to go to Dea. As she's driving, she notices a car light getting closer and closer to her from behind until it bumps her in the back of the car. Addie is trying to stay in control of the car as the person behind her keeps banging into her. It gets to the point where she loses control and she goes off the side of the road, her car flipping a few times, landing upside down. Addie is is seriously injured and out of it, but she knows that someone is approaching the car trying to get her out. The man grabs her and not so delicately just pulls her out of the car so she's slicing her back and shoulders like with glass. She's already injured, probably hit her head. The man says, once you're healed up, you're gonna be worth a pretty penny. And then before everything goes black, she feels a pinch of pain and a time to go to sleep, princess. End of book one. Cliffhanger number two. That was Haunting Adeline. And I'm haunted by this book. Yes. It was done very well, but it's still, content-wise, rough. Yeah. Brutal. And you and I are both currently reading the second one, Haunting Adeline. Oh, my God. And um, I, I feel haunted and hunted by this duet. Okay, so that was a lot. If you stuck with us, you deserve a drink. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I need a drink now after dishing through that. Holy moly. What are some of your love slash hates for this book? I know that we kind of like talking about things as we were going through, but anything that we didn't talk about that you have? So I did love the overall pacing of this book. Like the timeline of events was more so realistic. It didn't feel super rushed. And like, I love how Adeline didn't really truly fall in love in book one. Right. Like she kind of starts to hint at it towards the very end, but I'm glad she's not sold on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I agree, because you know, time within plot is one of my like trigger points. And I thought that this book was more realistic because I feel like with this type of material, it can't just be like, he stalks her, they fall in love. Like that is a very complicated dynamic. And I think that the time that it kind of progresses is like, it was needed. Very much so. And I definitely agree that I appreciated some like time jumps and stuff like that. Kind of going on plot. I was in the dark on a lot of the plots. Like I didn't really know what was happening, but I was never lost either. Because this book just has so much going on. 
Yeah, there's, there's so many different dynamics. You have, like, the stalking. You have the cold case. You have all the stuff with, like, Z and his corporation and, like, the trafficking. And, and then you have so the much. secret society, the government. Like, it's it's just, it's a lot of shit being thrown. And as much as it was a mystery, because this is a thriller, mystery type of book, but I was never lost in being like, wait, what is happening? Like, I was able to track the progression and not lose sight or like, you know what I mean? Yes. Because sometimes it's frustrating where it's just so much is thrown at you, but then you're like, wait. You didn't have to like stuff. reread sections to be like, okay, are we, which thing are they talking about with the multitude of plot lines happening? Right. It was very easy to follow, even though there was a lot being thrown at us. And I appreciate that. Something I kind of wish for a little bit, I'm not super mad at, but like when we were talking about Ronaldo finally being revealed and like how him and Zayd are very similar. I kind of wanted it to come out that like Zayd was like Ronaldo's child or something. I think that would have been crazy. I mean, would it be a little too far-fetched or do you think that it would be something that you would actually like I wouldn't obviously I wouldn't want Zayd to be like um Gigi and Ronaldo's child, but like I kind of would have been here for it. I feel that. So as far as like characters go, I loved Dea, and I loved Sibby. I think that they were Same. both fantastic secondary characters. They brought so much extra dimension to the book, especially with Dea, like when I would get so pissed off with Addie, because she's kind of one of my hates. Mm-hmm. Thank goodness Dea was there to make up for, for Addie's faults. Yeah, and then Sibby just brings this like chaotic, you're kind of just like, what in the world is going happening like this girl is bonkers but she's so funny and endearing at the same time and she's not in a whole lot of this book no she's just in the murder and then she gets in the same affair yeah but like in just in those scenes though I was like this girl is I'm here for it. I'm here for her her chaotic just murder sprees I mean the smut in this book top tier oh my god Bring- tip in the hat Bring it on. Yeah. So do you have any hates? Um, obviously the themes of this book. Um, yeah. Pedophilia, human trafficking, uh, human sacrifice, stalking, uh, murder. Yeah, all pretty uh, bad themes. Things that you don't feel so good reading about. It's just that's all this book is. It was well done, but I hate it. Because, you know, for us, we can get through books pretty quick. And I think that we finished this within like maybe two, three days, but like even I kind of had to like pause. And some elements were just like, it's a lot to read. I definitely had to step away from the book a time or two. Yeah. Or five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like, like you said, I think the themes is a hate, obviously, but the book is very well done. It's very well done. It's just that it is a good read. It's just that like, be prepared. Mm-hmm. This is not an easy read. No, it's definitely not. One hate that I have that I won't like go off the deep end because I've already ranted. Oh, I know what this is going to be then. (laughs) Zayd, unfortunately, has a god complex. Yeah, he does. I hate it. I don't like really, really hate it. The more I'm reading the second book too, the god complex is also sprinkled in there. You mean uh, thunderstormed in there? Yeah. I'm actually kind of okay with it just because this book is just so wild that I feel like, you know. It kind of takes you out of like the darkness of it and yeah. gives you something to. Because it's, it's, it's happening between Addie and Zade, And anything surrounding them is like the only light. Valid. I guess. But it's, it's growing on me. It's still a hate. I still don't like it. It's like I could do without it. But in this setting, it it's makes growing on me. Yeah. In the first book, it really bothered me. Like, I highlighted it on my Kindle, and I, like, counted. I think there were, like, eight separate incidences where he is, like, when, like, call me God. Like, pray to me. I am your salvation. I am, you know what I mean? And it's just, like, Ugh. it's slowly growing on me. I could do without it, though. Okay? That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Love it, though. And then also just, like, how many shitty characters are in this book? Like, how many villains? There's so many. Normally you have, like, 
You have like two. Yeah. <laughs> and like some henchmen that barely no. matter. Like they move the plot forward. But like this, this book has like sections, of like different villains in each section of this book, it feels like. Thankfully, the majority of them have been killed. Yes. Yes. We got a couple that are in the wind. One that hasn't been identified. Right. But we got a whole nother book. Right. But like, I just was like, they would get rid of one and it was just like someone else would pop up. And I'm just like, can these people not get a break? Instead of whack-a-mole, it's whack-a-villain. <laughs> whack-a-villain. Yeah, seriously. That's what it feels like. It's like one goes down, another one pops up. <laughs> another five pop up. I guess that's like realistic though. Yeah. Especially for the themes. Yeah. Don't like it. But realistic. It is realistic. Do you have any other hates that really stood out to you? No, I think that's, I think that about does it. Okay. So let's please get into some fun stuff. Yes. <laughs> yes. Let's jump into our casting call. Da, 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 da. Yay. So for this episode, we did Zaid, Adeline, Gigi, and Dea, and Sabi. Mm-hmm. So we did five. This is kind of more extreme, but we really liked these characters. And got to give you some 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 sunshine uh, amongst the doom and gloom that was this book. <laughs> yes. So without further ado, let's just <laughs> let's just hop into this. Let's start with Zade, Henry Cavill. Ah, Superman and the Witcher. Yes. You know, with my casting, I'm very I like trying to pinpoint how they're kind of portrayed and like he's a big guy Mm -hmm. Zade's a big guy he's like 6'6 and you know when I was reading this when it was like when they were first describing him being like tall dark haired muscular like this like he is who I had in mind and I feel like he could really play this character so who do you have who is your Zade my Zade is Ethan Peck who is that got the the dark hair I mean he has a very similar vibe to like Henry. Yeah, he's not as beefy Bulky. Yeah. as Henry is. Um, he was in the show 10 Things I Hate About You. Um, okay. He's in the new Star Trek movies. Very cool. Okay, I like that. Different choices. Just his face gives me, like, I don't know, stalker vibes. <laughs> no, I get that. Yeah, for sure. And I could see him having the scar. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Ethan Peck and Henry Cavill. Let's move on to our Addie, our Adeline. So I have Debbie Ryan, Zoe Dutch. For those two, I kind of wanted to go for the more, the descriptors of Adeline, like having like cinnamon hair. So like having that like lighter brown. My third choice, I think is my overall choice, who I think would look so good with Henry specifically. I don't know how I feel about Zoe and Debbie specifically with um, Henry as the casting. Yeah. Sophia Bush. Also, Especially that raspy the voice. The voice. Something about Addie is like, it's just her voice is always kind of mentioned that it's like this husky, like very seductive. Very Sophia Bush. <laughs> and like Sophia Bush was like the first person I thought of. And like honestly, if they aged them up a little. Which I'm totally fine with and kind of prefer. Yeah, I think that, I think Sophia Bush and Henry would, I mean, they would just be so beautiful together. Yeah, I think- so, like, I think Sophia is my, like, top choice for my Addie. And that's a good one. So, and you have two? I have two. So, who, who are yours? So, my picks for Addie, um, the first one is Shay Mitchell. Ooh, okay. And then my second choice is Megan Fox. Heck yeah. I mean. I think she could totally pull off this role. I do, too. And I think I, they would both look, I think both choices would look good with Ethan. Yes, they would. And I mean, I'm not mad at the Shay either. I think that Shay could do that role as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think Shay would be a good Addy. Okay. I'm not mad at those. So we have Shay Mitchell, Megan Fox, Sophia Bush, Zoe Dutch, and Debbie Ryan as our candidates for Adeline. Uh, who's your pick for Dea? So I do have two. Same. So I did one who was a choice that I would probably put with more of a Debbie um, Zoe pick. And then I have a pick who would be the Sophia. That's exactly why I have two Deas. I paired one with Shay, one with Megan. Okay, so for Debbie and Zoe, I have Vanessa Morgan, 
who is from Riverdale. Yes, I like her a lot. Yeah, and I think in Riverdale, I really like her character. I like her acting. Mm -hmm. I think that she would be a really good Dea. And for my Sophia Bush, I chose Jessica Shore. She's from Gossip Girl. She plays Vanessa in Gossip Girl. <laughs> <laughs> and so I don't know, because I, I could see her and like Sophia being more, yeah, you know, those two as besties. I'm here for that. So those were my cho- my two choices. What about you? So my two choices, Dea to pair with Megan is Janelle Monet. Okay. And then my Dea to pair with Shay Mitchell is Yara Shahidi. Oh. She's from uh, the show Grownish. Yes. Okay. I like both of those too. So we have Yara. We have Janelle. Mm-hmm. We have Vanessa. And we have Jessica. All great picks. All great picks. I think that any one of those could play that day a role. And I love it. And aesthetically pleasing as well. Yeah. <laughs> and as for Gigi casting. So Gigi obviously is the great grandma. The great grandmother of Adeline. So I have two. I have one. Okay. So I have either Julia Roberts or Elizabeth Banks. And if I'm being honest, at first, I was leaning towards Julia, but actually, I think Elizabeth Banks because Gigi's portrayed as being like this blonde, like blonde, and Elizabeth Banks for me all the way. Like I love her; she's, she's great. so great. So like I could see her doing the Gigi. And who's yours? My Gigi is Reese Witherspoon. Ooh, we pulled out the big guns for Gigi. We weren't playing for our casting. No. So Reese, Julia, and Elizabeth. Yeah, and Reese just kind of has that like 40s, 50s air about her. She does. See, and that's kind of how I felt about Elizabeth. Yeah. Because like that picture that I chose, I don't know. Just I could see her with like the shorter blonde hair, the curls. Yeah. Yeah. Careful. All right. And on to probably one of my the f- like most fun I had for casting for this week, Sibby. The Spitfire. That is Sibby. <laughs> yes. So how many Sibbies did you cast? One. Okay, I have two. I could give an honorable mention. Okay, okay. So my two. I have Alexa Demi, who is, she is in Euphoria. She plays Maddie, I believe, yeah. in Euphoria. And like that picture, she even has the knife. Like, come on. I could just see her being like very unstable, being able to like get into that mind like headspace. That's a good Sibby choice. And then my second one is Nessa Barrett. Don't know if she acts, but she's like a singer TikTok star. I don't really know her. Yeah. I just like aesthetically, like that's kind of what I was picturing Sibby kind of to look like just in a doll costume. And like Nessa is like, she's like young looking, she's petite. And like, if she could act, I could see her like going into that kind of that kind of unhinged. Yeah. So who's your Sibby? So my Sibby choice is Aquafina. Oh, okay. I just think she could do that role, and she so would be well. funny because mm-hmm. Sibby has a little bit of like a humor, a humor to her. Like she's dark and twisted, but she is still funny because she's so dark and twisted, mm-hmm. essentially. <laughs> and I, I don't know. I just feel like Aqu- Aquafina could do it oh. really, really well. Oh, wow. And then. I guess I could give an honorable mention nomination to Miley Cyrus. That's a good one, too. Okay, so I, I guess what we're saying is that, like, this movie needs to happen or a TV show or something, and we have all the casting. Yeah. <laughs> Let us know. <laughs> Let us know what you think. All of our casting calls will be on Instagram. The link will also be in the bio for the podcast. Let us know what you were kind of picturing, who you were picturing, because that's the great thing about doing these, is like you can interpret it in any way that you really want. It's now some more sunshine and rainbows. <laughs> it's a bit of shock to God, right? <laughs> what is your song choice? Okay. Song choices. Song choices. Because I, ha- I have four. I have four as well. One of mine is from the book playlist. So at the beginning of this book, there is a playlist provided by the author. So I picked one of those songs and then three of my own choices. So I did not choose from the list that was provided to us, but I did kind of do three that like I really liked. And then my fourth was kind of just like a throwback, kind of like this just sums it all up. 
So my first choice was Yes and No by XYLO. Encompasses Addie's kind of like back and forth. She's like, you know, pushing Zeta Wade, but then bringing him closer. She can't decide if she likes him or if she hates him. And it's always kind of like that back and forth-ness. So my first one is from the book playlist. It's um, Something Better by The Broken View. Ooh, okay. So this one is uh, for Zayd and Addie's relationship. And also Zayd's trying to better the world sort of thing. Getting rid of evil. Mm -hmm. Okay. The next song choice I have is Tag Your It by Melanie Martinez. And this just gives like, Melanie Martinez's album that this is on is just like very like carnival-y. So it like, it gives that like carnival vibe. And for me personally, I thought that Satan's Affair was like a really big monumental kind of like staple in this book. Yes. It was something that like plot wise, I really like held on to as a staple essentially. And so this song is just kind of like tag your it, like he's coming after her. It's kind of like that like cat and mouse stalk prey esque like with their relationship. Great. And it's just a really good song. It is a good song. It's just really good. <laughs> And also kind of gives me the stalker vibes, too. Yes. Yeah. So my next one is Obsessed With You by The Orion Experience. That's a good one, too. Because that's just totally about a stalker being obsessed with someone. And that's this book. Obsessed With You? Yep. I don't think that really needs more explaining. No. <laughs> my third choice was NBFWMB by Hosier, which the is fuck. which is nobody... <laughs> Nobody fucks with my baby. That's what the acronym stands for. Okay. And it's very much just being like, no one fucks with Zayd's baby. Like, but him. You know what I mean? Very true. And so it's just that very, like, possessive element of the relationship, I feel like. You're not wrong. Yeah. What's your third choice? So my third choice is the song Dangerous by Control Delete. Okay. And it's about Addie and, like, her fear kink. Basically, oh. is how I see that song. Okay. Okay. And she does have a fear kink. She lives for the danger danger. She does. She likes being scared. And my last song, which is kind of my like throwback song, is Obsessed by Mariah Carey. Like, why are you so obsessed with me? I just feel like that is, you know, Addie's point of view being like, why? Like, ugh, why, why are you so obsessed, obsessed with me? me? Why me? Yes. So those are my four songs. And then my last one is Victim by the Half-Lives. Oh, that's a good song, too. And I, I think that's a very Zayd and Addy song. Yeah. Why am I your victim? Pretty much. But I like it. But I like it. At the same time, why? But okay, come but closer. Hey. <laughs> so those were our top choices for this, for song choices for Haunting Adeline. If you want more, we have lots more songs in our playlist. Yeah, because this playlist is for book one and book two. And we will actually be doing book two next week. Mm -hmm. So you guys don't have to wait on the cliffhanger. So you can find playlist link in the episode description and also on our Instagram, Emotions and Potions Pod. Like, subscribe, follow. All the things, all the buttons, all the positives. <laughs> Yes, only positives. Okay, so we're moving on to the last segment. Rating. Our rating. All right. Should we do spice first? Yeah. Okay. What did you give this, Alex? This was definitely very spicy. Yes. I'm going to give this a 4.5. I kind of want to give it a higher rating, but I'm a little jaded with that since I'm in the second one, and I feel like that one's... Even more. Even more. So I kind of had a... So I docked this one okay. <laughs> because of that. So I'm going to go 4.5. What about okay. you? So I was the same way. I had this ranked higher until I started reading the second book. And then I was like, hmm, questionable. So I did kind of like a range. I gave it like a 4.2 to like a 4.4. Um, I, I think there are elements in the smut that make it really spicy. Like the gunplay, like that is very taboo kind of left field yeah that's automatically gonna make it go up also like the dubious consent and like non-consent mm -hmm. consent non-consent it's like those elements are also very intense so like this is a very intense smutty book but book number two is even 
more. So yeah, like a 4.2 to 4.4 kind of. And you gave it a 4.5. So like we're on the same like thought wave. Yeah, it's definitely up there in muddiness. 1000%. Overall rank or rating. What did you give this book? I give this book a 9 out of 10. Same. Me too. It was hard. The themes are very hard to get through, but it is so well written. And it really is a great book. It is. Like, I think I've said this before. Like, if a book can make me feel, it doesn't matter what the feelings are, I'm here for it. And this had me all over the place. All over the place on a huge emotional roller coaster. It also had me being like internalizing how I was feeling, being like, why am I feeling this way? Mm -hmm. And it's also one of those things where it was like, for me, I would feel one way and then I would feel the other way. Like it was a roller coaster. It's not like you're always feeling one emotion. No, it was a lot of whiplash. Yes. Because it's also like a dark book. So it's kind of like, is this bad that I am kind of into this and that I don't hate what's going on on some level? <laughs> and then on a lot of levels, I absolutely hated it. The, right. the things that are happening. So I, it was just so well done. The characters were well developed. Plot was well developed. There wasn't a lot of plot holes. Obviously, it's a cliffhanger book, so it leaves us on a big cliffhanger. But I knew that going in, so it doesn't make me mad. But she closes off some elements that need to be closed. Yeah, like we get the um, you know the resolution to the to Gigi's murder. So it's like I wasn't left with more questions surrounding that aspect, surrounding that aspect, and just other things like you know we did get other villains' deaths. Mm -hmm. as new ones started to get introduced. So it just, it was done well instead of just piling. Right, and even like with the Sibby thing, that with her plot line kind of ending with her being arrested and being sent to the psych ward, I mean, that wraps it up. Like, you know, it's not like she's just kind of in the wind or yeah. whatever, like that plot point. And so, yeah, I just thought it was a really well done book. No, this is pretty, you're pretty thrown in. Yeah. It's pretty dark. So all in all, is this yeah. a love or a hate letter? I have to go love. I'm going to give it both. <laughs> yeah. Okay, explain. I'm giving it a love letter because I do love this book. But I'm giving a hate letter for the themes. Because real life, I, I, no way I can give a love letter to human trafficking, child trafficking, pedophiles, stalking. Stalking, anything. Like, nope, can't, can't do that. No. So um, that's going to get a hate letter. Oh, for sure. When it comes to the content that we're dealing with, I hated every second of it. But this book in H.D. Carlton, love, love. Next week, we're going to pick it up with Hunting, Adeline. I, yeah. This book has haunted and hunted me, so. And you know, I'm glad that we're doing this for the pod because it's very therapeutic. Like, I definitely feel like I need to talk about this book once I finished reading it. Oh, definitely. Because you need to decompress. Yeah. So if, if and you're this, the only person I can talk to about these things. Right. So thank you for listening to yet another episode of Emotions and Potions, a love slash hate letter to Haunting Adeline. I'm Ashton. And I'm Alex. Thanks for listening and tune in next week when we continue and pick up where we left off. Oh, the trauma. Oh, the trauma. Bye. See you then.